so good afternoon everyone it is actually uh, today is 18th of may though 20th of may from 2005 we celebrate international clinical trials day worldwide but we are actually organizing one cme today and we are really fortunate today to have vice chancellor of west bengal university of health science professor surita paul who is a very important mentor guide for indian pharmacological society west bengal chapter for long time so we are really privileged to have madam with us today in this academic event also we have our director of medical education professor professor hattach devashish hattacharya sir with us who is also very much helpful for development of our fraternity our subject so welcome sir so without any delay may i request professor shurita pal madam to give us her welcome address over to madam thank you shambo a very good afternoon to all present my seniors my colleagues and my junior friends uh, i am so very happy that indian pharmacological society is organizing this symposium on the clinical trials day which is on 20th but i consider 18th also good enough for uh, organizing such uh, programs and uh, since we are majority of us i hope today it's the pharmacologists who are the principal uh, members who are attending this symposium so being pharmacologist clinical research is something that we talk about and we are into most of us but uh, what i think there are so many aspects of the clinical trials day what we should try is so that others are also oriented all around us the budding researchers budding in, uh, in our uh, mes or maybe in our colleges uh, coming to the academic part that they are more oriented with clinical research and clinical trials or clinical researches are done in accordance with gcp uh, we all know that institute of health and family welfare is organizing such gcp programs and uh, university also has started its satellite events uh, in gcp one was done in uh, bardwan medical college then in medical college kolkata and so on so this is a very good attempt very good effort taken by the indian pharmacological society west bengal uh, chapter i really wish to thank and congratulate our uh, new energetic young general secretary and also uh, shambo and also the president uh, our beloved tapunda such so and now every uh, day i mean we the quick succession very regularly we are having academic discussions and uh, very is and i'm sure that this is going to help us a lot in our excellence and enhance the place only to just add on that after this we as pharmacological and clinical trials that they should be done in a proper manner um, our peer group and fellow colleagues not of our the other department who are us thank you thank you madam thank you very much so now we have professor devashish hattacharya sir with us so may i request sir to say a couple of words on this issue over to sir good afternoon and it's really a pleasure that the pharmacological society has initiated this great effort from your end and i do appreciate that all of us should really work together so that as per gcp we, are, we can encourage our faculties and our students to go for research in a proper direction and quite naturally that as a department from uh, pharmacology definitely uh, makes a lead role in this and i wish and pray to the almighty that let us really start working in a proper manner proper phase b 
and so that we can really do progress in research and West Bengal can show the path to the rest of the country. Thank you and wish you all the best for this. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So now may I request our Vice President, today present Professor Lopamudra Choudhury. So Madam, if you want to say a couple of words to us, then we will start our academic event. Lopamudra, Madam. Madam, you have to unmute yourself. Once again, I thank uh, Professor Shurita Pal, Madam, and Professor Devashish Kottacharya, sir, to give us their valuable time. Uh, we wish that you, you bless our society and help us guiding to how to develop clinical trials in, in uh, West Bengal context from our society, we will try our best to do that. So now may I request our uh, Vice President, Professor Lopa Mudra Choudhury, Madam, to say a couple of words, then we'll start our academic program. So I think there is some issue from our side. So we have to move to our, uh, our academic session and for first session, uh, that is clinical trials and historical perspective. Uh, actually, I, I am the speaker, but we are really fortunate. Sorry, Sorry that I, uh, I didn't unmute myself. Yeah, so yeah. just a bit of time. Yes, yes. Uh, can I, yes. Uh, Thanks, uh, thanks to uh, President, uh, Secretary, and IPS West Bengal branch for honoring me to be a part of this session. And thanks to our DME sir and our VC to be part of this session too. It was very nice for their to hear their valuable words. And um, I think we should uh, start this session as early as possible. And uh, Shambhu can start his, uh, his part. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam. So, Matt, uh, today we have. Our past, for past session, we have two renowned chairpersons. Uh, we have Professor Jyotir Moy Pal, sir, who is currently Professor of Medicine, General Medicine at Archikor Medical College. He is also a pioneer in education of medicine uh, in all over India. So uh, he is also Dean Elect of Indian College of Physicians. So may I now request Professor Jyotir Moy Pal, sir, to say a couple of words. Uh, then we'll start next academic program. I think Sushanto Bandhupadhyay, sir, is joining soon. So we will wait for him also. Sir, please. Uh, I, I appreciate Dr. Shambhu Samazdar for his great enthusiasm. And, uh, and I have seen he is conducting so many time-honored issues uh, in webinar that helps the next generation physicians and students a lot. The clinical research, the topic he has chosen, definitely uh, we in different forum, academic forum, we discuss very less, but this is the importance. You know, India has advanced in many aspects, in, uh, in particular in the IT technology, defense technology, agriculture technology, but not so in the medical medical research. There is so many issues in the clinical research, basically clinical research in the uh, in the ancient India, India was very much advanced in, in medical uh, in medical in advance in discovery of a different medical technology by hand of Chorok and Shushuto. After that, there is a dark age. Then the British came and the Renaissance start and but even after the independence, research in India, particularly the medicine, medical field is not advanced so much. So, so we, 
we the indians we say uh, frequently we are overburdened to see the patient but this is not the end of the story so we we physician should be very much aware should be very much conscious of the research technology and uh, and this can help indian to reach a new generation in the uh, in the in the present century so i wish the all success of this webinar on clinical research and uh, and uh, thank you dr samazdar for your excellent initiative thank you sir thank you very much sir so now may i request other chair chairperson professor shushanto bandopadhyay ex director of Medi uh, medical education and ex official secretary of west bengal also one of our pioneer member of indian pharmacological society so sir please say couple of word before i start today's uh, first academic session over to sir sir you have to unmute Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sambo. Uh, uh, I heartily welcome uh, all of us, all of you who are present here in this uh, seminar uh, on uh, actually clinical pharmacology, uh, or in other way, it is uh, the clinical pharmacology day, particularly clinical trial day, in fact. Now, uh, actually, the history of clinical trial goes long back because we, even we were students in those days. And uh, we, uh, when we were students of pharmacology, when we started pharmacology, in fact, uh, we learned a lot about clinical pharmacology. But they, actually, if we go back, uh, most probably the whole thing init was initiated after the biggest of the big disaster and that disaster was thalidomide disaster because uh, before that the drugs which were being developed were sporadically developed even we all know that when penicillin was discovered and that penicillin was uh, uh, rampantly used during second world war and fortunately that penicillin saved thousands of lives and by and large one of the safest antibiotic uh, except uh, one uh, adverse effect we all know but with a subsequent uh, time after uh, this uh, disaster the helsinki helsinki declaration came and then then gradually the ethical constraint becomes more and more stringent quite obviously even nowadays so we all know that we are not even in a position to uh, uh, say say in a position to take uh, sporadic error and at rampantly animal experiment also for that reason also there are so many ethical constraints quite reasonably quite obviously and uh, i am very uh, happy that Uh, in this day, uh, International Clinical Trial Day, this uh, actually uh, I will I think Shambhu will tell uh, a uh, elaborate description of this uh, historical perspective of this. With this few introductory word, I heartily welcome Dr. Shambhu Samazdar. Uh, he is MD, DM, the clinical pharmacologist. he is one of my student when i was principal in ajigarh he was doing md but after that he did zim also in tropical medicine and as secretary of our society west bengal he has been doing a tremendous job so with these few introductory words i heartily welcome shambhu to initiate his deliberation thank you thank you very much thank you sir thank you professor jyotirmoy pal sir and professor shushanto bandopadhyay sir so actually we have a plethora of speakers next so i just try to set the context of international clinical trial day who will discuss few historical perspectives so let's start with story of james lind 
because twentieth May is famous for this doctor, Doctor James Lin. So we know that in the twentieth of May, seventeen forty-seven, the sheep HMS Salisbury, where he had first time divided in six pairs the twelve sick sailors who were were suffering from scurvy. There were multiple treatment options. So one group he had given that two oranges and one lemon, and that works tremendously. So actually, this was the first time in history some documentation that happened that one clinical trials was done. But though we can see the 1747 that the study was done, but it took almost 50 years. to have that compel compulsory notice to include orange and lemon in the diet of the sailors so there were some issues though we can see this this treaties of the scurvy the first documentation that came of uh, much before 1753 but it took almost 50 years so there are some issues but one thing we need to accept we need to acknowledge that first time in the history of clinical research he had used some variable controlling so all subjects were in similar con conditions and first time they had compared like versus like so like was compared with like and there was another important issue though that was we can say now it is a secondary outcomes but in 18th century the he he had used some technology to distill the fresh water from sea water and that time it was we can say a revolution like thing to uh, emphasizing occupational health but he was why he was confused because the expense of that particular fruit and also the perishability of the fruit and he actually used one complicated method to prepare inspissated juice so what happened we know that by heating the vitamin we, we lost vitamin c and that time the concept of vitamin c was not there so that is why the 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 other uh, scientist think the time of 50 years was passed to ultimately convince british government to make it a regulation what about previous documentation there were some previous documentations during vasco da gama time richard hawkins time they had used this orange and lemons but this documentation was not uh, present in lind's treatise of the scurvy now we know that while doing clinical research we give emphasis on review of literature so this was something which was missed in lind's treatise of scurvy let's discuss few things about pre james lind era clinical researches which had started from 562 bc we know this book of daniel where we uh, there were a famous king nebuchadnezzar from babylon who had ordered his people to eat only meat and drink only wine and this diet he believed would keep them in sound physical condition but several young men of royal blood who preferred to eat vegetables objected and then the king allowed these rebels to follow a diet of legumes and water only for 10 days but what happened the vegetarians appeared better nourished than the meat eaters and now the king permitted the legume lovers to continue their diet so this is the open uncontrolled human experiment that is in the time of 562 bc and what is most important this experiment actually guided a decision about public health we all know this trials now ongoing of this vegan diets vegetable uh, based diet which improves our health i am not going in details but this was first time 5662 bc they were uh, studied now coming to another important era that is avicenna who had uh, 
the, who had been writing this canon of medicine, they had used, they had mentioned this line in their book that a remedy should be used in its natural state in disease without complications when we are going to study that remedy for their efficacy. So study be made of the time of action and the reproducibility of the effects that also need to given emphasize and that was mentioned in this ancient book. But what happened? No record of this application of these principles that was done in day-to-day uh, -day practice that was observed. And very importantly, this line is important because from canon of medicine, that is a treatment should be tested in a controlled environment to reduce confounding factors. And in this case, by excluding patients with complex comorbidities. Now we all know in clinical trials, we use this formula. Now in 1537, the Ambroise Parik, who is responsible for the treatment of the battlefield wounded soldiers had done the first clinical trial of a novel therapy. And this was conducted accidentally. Generally, the conventional treatment was cottering the wound and some oil was given in that particular wound. But what happened? Oil was not adequately available to treat all the wounded. So unconventional treatment approach he had taken, he had placed a digestive made of yolks and eggs all oil of roses and turpentine and put there without cottering. But what happened? He uh, at, the, at the morning, he wake up in the early morning because he was feeling that those who were treated with unconventional treatment will be screaming very high. So he was going to attend them. But surprisingly, it was seen that unconventional treatment arm slept well. There was little pain, wound not inflamed or swollen. And that actually, change his practice. So they, he had never again burned those, that means cautery those with uh, cruelly in that uh, wounded part by guns and uh, arquebuses. Let's talk about post James Lynn era. So first 1800, there was arrival of placebo. We know what is placebo? Placebo, there is one a uh, comment like that, it takes the place of the actual substance and bogus. So this was first time in Hooper's Medical Dictionary, 1811, they defined placebo like that. And if it had given to any medicine more to please than benefit the patient. So 1863, United States physician Austin Flint planned this first clinical study comparing a dummy remedy to an active treatment. And this was given regularly and became well known in their words as placeboic remedy for rheumatism. This was present in the book, A Treatise of the Principle of Practice of Medicine. In 1886, he had described it. But there was another concept of nocebo. So who the, the youngsters, the young pharmacologists, young students who are present today, you may nurture this word, what is nocebo? So another important area. My professor, Prof. Shushanto Bandhavaddai sir, has mentioned the importance of penicillin. There is, at the same time, when the penicillin we get from, uh, by Alexander Fleming, after a few days, there was a tremendous discussion on another extraction from penicillium patulinum. They had discussed its chemical and biological properties in Lancet and check whether it is beneficial in viral infections. So there were suddenly the newspapers, they took those news and make some headlines like more valuable than penicillin we got. Will it make our servicemen fight better? Because that was the over time. So whether they can put this uh, drug for the soldiers who are suffering from common colds and can treat them. 
so in this pressure past time the double blind placebo control trial was done with patulin for common cold in 1943 and here you can see the qrst code so they effectively random concurrent allocation of patulin or control solutions to the participants so ultimately it was found that patulin was not beneficial for the common cold but this study was very important to note because one of the very uh, key features of clinical trials that is double blind placebo control trial was came up with this uh, uh, concept so next a uh, landmark thing is the streptomycin and we all know this streptomycin trial sir bradford hilt so this is the first time where the systematic enrollment criteria and data collection method was used so sir bradford hilt had been anxious that the physician should be unwilling to give up the doctrine of the an anecdotal experience but this trial this results actually convinced all the physicians and they had taken it to treat tuberculosis there was another concept that is allocation concealment we often use nowadays so first time it was used uh, in the streptomycin tuberculosis trial so what is allocation concealment we defined it as like that this is one type of technique to prevent selection bias by concealing the allocation sequence from those assigning participants to the intervention groups until the moment of the assignments so this prevents researchers unconsciously or otherwise from influencing which participants are assigned to the intervention group or control group another important message from this trial was the interpretation of the expressed by the experts who were also blinded to the patient's treatment assignments so objective measurements there was some issues of ethics whether giving placebo was uh, actually ethical but what happened the amount of streptomycin available from uh, us was very much limited that time and that is why by that they justify the ethics issues now as we are talking about ethics clinical research the ethics is an integral part and we need to know how it how there was evolution so evolution of ethics starts from different atrocities we know nazi war crimes how they were exposed to extremes of temperature just to see how much the changes that happen until they, the participants die we know about the jewish chronic disease more model how the cancer tissue was injected in the healthy adults healthy elderly people to see how the rejections happened by the normal cells to those cancer cells we know the tuskegee syphilis trials even there was availability of penicillin to treat syphilis but the 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 negro people negro americans the african american people who were not given the penicillin therapy who were the prisoners so tasky syphilis trials was there just to see the natural history of the syphilis they 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 check those patients next the willow brook study how the how they used the mentally challenged uh Uh, students by injecting or just seeing the natural history of hepatitis there was no treatment given to see the hepatitis a natural course we know the milgram study the psychological pressures that given to those subjects without informing them about the experimental procedures we all know about thalidomide dis disaster here we can see the the dr mcbride who the austrian doctor who at first time noticed this and had raised voice against this uh, focomelia this report this focomelia and the the world actually awakened with this thalidomide disaster and with all these atrocities 
there was uh, there were some knee jerk response and evolution of ethical principles the after that uh, uh, after that uh, e event of this uh, focomelia events and thalidomide disaster the there were there were 1962 kf over hadi simon amendments happened after that uh, uh, nazi war crimes there when remember code that uh, came up in 1947 declaration of helsinki comes with world medical organization in 1964 and belmont report in 1969 so belmont reports which has three important aspects to respect persons to give emphasize the maximizing the possible benefits by beneficiaries and then the justice that means equitable distribution of chance to be selected in the clinical research to share fairly the chance of benefits and burdens of medical research and that should be evenly distributed the kefauver had its amendment which strengthened the federal oversights of drug testing and that include a requirement of informed consent and obviously the nuremberg code which gives emphasis on essentiality of the voluntariness of the consent and declaration of helsinki consists of general principles and specific guidelines on use of human medical uh, subjects in clinical research so gcp came up, uh, came so 1990s ultimately there was the decade of harmonization so international conference on harmonization of technical requirements for registration of pharmaceutical use for hu uh, human use so that comes so that conference there were uh, primary participants like usa european union japan regulatory and industry representatives there were observers like canada from canada australia and nordic countries and who acts as a facilitator they came up with icai gcp the these qsem that, that was the main topics and what is gcp gcp means quality data plus ethics and ethics mean the multiplied product of morality and materialism the science and morality and what is quality data that means data and reported results should be credible and accurate and ethics means rights integrity and confidentiality of the trial subjects are protected so now talk about indian context and we all should give emphasize on that we talk about gcp the 1990s uh, there were uh, lots of ethical movements happening in the field of clinical research but long 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 ago in upanishad there was an important uh, shloka that is atmana pratikulani pareshu na samachare that means do unto others what you would like others to do unto, unto you if we can fo follow this rule as a investigator then i think every research will be ethical and we all should believe our charaka our susruta they had developed wonderful protocols to be ethical in research works and the charak samhita that contains lots of outcome studies and with that if we consider the uh, newer developments in indian clinical research starting from 1940s the drugs and cosmetic acts then 1945 the drugs and cosmetic rules then schedule y amendment that happened in the 2005 the cdso came up with indian good clinical practice guideline in 2001 and also the icmr the ethical guidelines of the icmr comes in 2000 which was revised in 2006 and also we are not back because we are also having guidelines on stem cell research therapy and that was the recent guideline was in 2017 and we have regulations and guidelines in india thorough regulations and guidelines by regulations by cdso and guidelines by icmr and we can see now the clinical trials in india in last 10 years from 2011 to 2020 there is a sharp rise 11% of global in clinical trial uh, data we are having in india yes in covid that was suffered but it is still 8.3% which was in 2011 at around 6.2% now if you 
ask what are the important steps that was taken in this 2000 between this 2011 to 2019 there were two important steps two important guideline revisions that happened one is national ethical guidelines for biomedical and health research involving human participants 2017 and next is the rule regulations that is new drug clinical trial rules which revolutionized the field of clinical trial and clinical research in india we all know that how clinical research can be defined if i am investigator i am if i am assigning exposure then it is obviously a experimental study if it is not if i as a investigator not assigning exposure so it will be observational study so for all practical purpose if i am doing one observational study we should be very thorough with this icmr guideline and if i am going to do the experimental study we should follow the new drug clinical trial rule 2019 so at the end when we are talking about clinical research ethics in uh, therapeutic misconception this question this shloka is very important that is yogastha kuru karmani swangam tvakta dhananjaya siddho asiddho samo bhutya samattam yoga uchyate samattam is the most important mantra for every aspect of life and in clinical research also we should follow as a clinical investigator we should be unbiased and that was very very uh, long ago lord krishna had told us with that i thank you all if you have any questions i request you you can put in the chat box we can discuss the questions in the chat box due to paucity of time and we have to move forward to our next session so with that i once again thank you all for listening and we have lots of uh, plethora of speakers now to take that edas thank you once again thank you uh, sir you have to unmute yourself sir uh i think you can hear me <coughs> thank you for your uh, elaborate and excellent uh, presentation uh, about the history we started from uh, you have started from babylonian age and till date you have come till date and we have uh, learned a lot we have heard a lot about uh, the detailed history of clinical trial of this uh, in one way auspicious day and i am particularly happy to see the participants actually this has become a national seminar today because i can see a number of clinic uh, clinical pharmacologists including some senior pharmacologists like one uh, i have seen the name of dr umila satte madam i do not know whether she is here or not my sincere regards to you madam um, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, in uh, in this webinar seminar because uh, now it is the choice of the day right now so with these few words uh, i will request to that for the next session to come up and uh, continue with this thank you thank you all thank you very much thank you sir thank you very much so now may i request our next for next session may i request professor shoilendra handu who is the professor and head aims rishikesh who is a renowned clinical pharmacologist so sir please uh come in the edias and now also may i request professor lopamudra choudhury who is the professor in the department of pharmacology archikor medical college and he is also the vice president of indian pharmacological society west bengal chapter to please chair the session over to handu sir and choudhury madam okay uh, uh, am i audible thank you yes sir thank you uh, dr shambhu uh, it's my uh, privilege and uh, pleasure uh, to join the group for uh, uh, today's cme i think uh, at the outset uh, i would like to congratulate the organizing committee uh, especially dr shambhu samajdar for uh, uh, this uh, excellent uh, you know uh, 
uh, event uh, that you are organizing. I think it, it's apt that uh, we are uh, meeting today uh, on the eve of International Clinical Trials Day and uh, uh, to deliberate upon uh, uh, an important area and uh, looking at various aspects related to clinical trials. I think uh, uh, it's my privilege to be uh, chairing uh, this uh, session. And uh, especially uh, I feel honored uh, because the next speaker uh, is uh, Professor uh, Shantanu uh, Tripathi. Uh, I have had a long association with uh, Professor Tripathi uh, right from the days when he was pursuing his uh, DM uh, clinical pharmacology at PGI in early 90s. So over the last three decades, uh, uh, Professor Tripathi has uh, contributed immensely uh, to the cause of clinical pharmacology and clinical trials. And uh, it's always a, a pleasure and honor to listen to him. Uh, uh, talking about Professor uh, Tripathi, uh, he's known for his scholarship, for his erudition, and for his passion uh, towards uh, clinical pharmacology in general, and specifically related to clinical trials. And uh, his, uh, he has mentored and uh, tutored uh, and guided uh, lots of students and uh, uh, has uh, immense contribution uh, to the discipline. Uh, his uh, presentations are always insightful and it's always a treat uh, to listen to them and uh, I look forward to his presentation. Uh, over to Professor uh, Chaudhary if she wants to add. Yes, I have nothing to add more, but uh, we are, our Tripathi sir is very much well known and he doesn't need any, he's also my sir and uh, he's my teacher and guide and we need no special mention. So today's uh, topic is very, very much important regarding this present situation and clinical trial is the cornerstone of new drug development and the challenges we should be and we are going to hear all the and yeah, this valuable lecture. Thank you, sir. We are welcome you for your next. I think I uh, invite uh, Professor uh, Tripathi. To, uh, uh, thank you, very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Handu and uh, Professor Lupa Mudra. I'm humbled with your kind words. Let me now go straight to the today's topic. Uh, just give me one minute for, yeah, this. Uh, is the screen visible? Yes, sir. Screen is visible. And am I audible? Yes, sir. Clearly. PPT is not open, sir. Is the PPT is not open? No, sir. So let me go out and try again. Yes, sir. Now we can see the PPT. Yeah, it's full screen, sir. Okay, okay, great. So today we are going to discuss uh, on this. This is an auspicious day and uh, clinical trials day, international clinical trials day. And we know the background, why it is called. Today is particularly called the international clinical trials day. It must, must have been discussed in the first presentation by Dr. Shambhu. Now I'm going to discuss. Yeah, this is a challenge area, rather. Uh, whenever we talk of conduct of clinical trials, okay, clinical trials are conducted with patients, with participants, uh, people who agree to take part in clinical trial or who volunteer to take part in clinical trial, and they, uh, they accept the test intervention or the standard intervention, comparator intervention, and which are actually compared 
Okay, that is the uh, purpose of doing clinical trial, whereby we get this opportunity to comparing uh, the test intervention with a comparator. The comparator could be either a placebo, rarely though, uh, or a prevailing standard treatment. But then the first uh, prerequisite is to get access to participants. When you talk of participants, as per the protocol, it defines who can be a participant in a clinical trial. Okay. And there is very, very precise selection criteria, inclusion and exclusion criteria. But again, uh, depending on the diagnosis or the indication for which the drug, the new uh, or the test uh, intervention is, is going to be compared or going to be tested, uh, the diagnosis could be a rare one where it poses special challenge in getting access to the diagnosis, right, uh, patient, uh, particularly if it is a rare uh, indication or rare diagnosis, then getting access to those patients will particularly pose some issues and problems. It also, it may depend on uh, specific therapeutic areas and the specialty areas. Uh, accordingly, you need to uh, get access to that specialist who can really become the investigator or who can help the investigator to get access to the patients which the specialist is providing care, okay? So these are actually uh, some challenge areas that we need to operate in order to successfully uh, initiate a clinical trial project. And we all know how it all starts. When you talk of uh, industry-sponsored new drug clinical trial, how it starts as an investigator or the site investigator, site coordinator, we receive a call from the uh, industry, concerned industry. We would like to explore whether there is, uh, there is enough amount of interest at the site to come up and uh, take part in the clinical trial as investigators. So it, it starts from there. And then of course the confidentiality agreement signing, getting access to the uh, synopsis of the clinical trial protocol, whereby uh, we'll, as the investigator, we'll, we'll, we'll go into the selection criteria and we try to understand whether it would be possible for, as an investigator, possible for us to get access to the right people for uh, participation in the trial, so that's how it starts. Then of course, we, yeah, at the site, we'll be receiving the feasibility questionnaire and maybe also feasibility visit, site feasibility or site inspection visit by the sponsor. So these are some of the initial steps in uh, initiating a trial yeah, at the site. Now, any clinical trial basically uh, aims to engage patients, patients or healthy volunteers, and there are uh, specific challenges in engaging patients in the trials. Uh, this is one uh, survey whereby they had shown that uh, if you start with 100 identified patients, okay, uh, and then you try to pre-screen qualify them, it is pre-screening, it is not yet screening, pre-screen qualify them, so that they are, uh, you can also assess their interest level, whether they are interested in taking part in the trial and then getting them to the site and where they are exposed to or they are put to the screening testing. And once they become eligible and then uh, they are uh, administered the informed consent, assuming that they consent, then they are enrolled in the study. Then you think of randomization, but even after randomization, when you say randomization, that is also a precise process. We, we may discuss in a couple of words. And then you need to have also the obligation of retaining those patients to the entire full period of exposure and also beyond that, if there is long-term follow-up for the entire period. So that is what is called retention. And at every step, there is a possibility of attrition. You start with 100 patients, you screen them uh, and find how many are qualifying, you find there is an attrition there. Then not necessarily all screen eligible patients will, will be consenting to participate in the trial. 
so there will be some people who will not agree to take part who don't consent for participation so there is another possibility of attrition there then even those who are who consent then you randomize at the time of randomization also when you explain okay even if they have consented when they further know that there is a possibility that uh, uh, they may get it to the placebo arm which means that uh, they are not going to really get treated their health problem is not going to be benefited for that matter so they may again opt out they may say that they may withdraw their consent so at that level also at the randomization level also there might be issues if those who have been randomized and you are continuing with the treatment for diverse reasons okay people may opt not to continue with the trial the drop out drop out is a very common phenomenon in clinical trial and that again depends on the uh, directly with the with the length of the exposure and length of the follow up the chances of drop out increases with the length of the uh, exposure or the follow up and finally only a few patients possibly will be completing uh, the trial so this is one survey where they have found that you start with 100 and you end up with only seven patients com having completed the uh, trial so there lies uh, challenges at every step so we'll discuss some of them and for that before that we need to understand that uh, what are the what are these uh, specific steps how how do we understand those specific steps now we have said that these prime basically these are the three uh, areas the recruitment of patients randomization of patients and retention of participants these are the three particular areas that pose serious challenges to success of a clinical and we are calling them the troubling trial the critical processes if we think they of them sequentially as we have just discussed it starts with recruitment it goes to screening from that the screen eligible they are put to informed consenting and once they consent they are enrolled in the study entering into the study and then you randomize them and finally it becomes our responsibility to retain them also and each and every step there are there might be issues let us try to quickly understand what we mean by these terms like if you start with recruitment what does that mean recruitment and how it, how does it distinct from enrollment how does it distinct from randomization etc recruitment means it is the process of actively seeking out and finding potential study participants so recruitment is not enrollment recruitment is considering uh, the people who are otherwise diagnosed known diagnosis okay and then have a general interest in participating in trial or they are patient they are primary caregiver or their physician uh, agrees to refer that patient to a clinical trial site so that is the process of uh, identifying the potential study participant that is the process of recruitment and if we if we strategize that properly then we can get enough number of such uh, potential study participants okay uh, so that we we can have a sufficient number of people who will finally become screen eligible and possibly some of um, a good a more good number of them would be finally consenting and we can think of enrolling them in this study so here in this uh, uh, cartoon what we have tried to show here that this is the practice site the hospital and this is the pre screening site and this is the clinical trial referral site so the pre screening pre screening is a part of recruitment that means the physician treating physician is actually doing the pre screening pre screening is different from screening true screening pre screening take takes a place uh, prior to the screening actual screening takes place in the clinical trial site but the pre screening is taking place uh, at the different uh, treatment areas where different physicians they can if they can be involved they can be otherwise uh, made a member of the network okay then and they can be convinced then they are actually can be considered as a recruiting officer okay for the potential participants so they will do so by pre screening in pre screening they will be identifying the right diagnosis for which the trial is being conducted and then they will have a discussion with these patients whether they have a general interest in getting involved or getting or volunteering in for participation in the study 
So in case the, the such patients, they agree, then this patient will be referred to the clinical trial site where the investigator will then put them into the actual screening procedure. Okay? And then uh, once they uh, become screen eligible, then the next course of action will follow. So this is about recruitment. And people try to do this recruitment. There are different uh, strategies have been tried. Like this is one uh, survey that was again done. The source I have mentioned at the bottom that uh, people tries to identify potential participants by uh, looking at the medical records. Unfortunately, in India, in our culture, we do not maintain very good medical records or the, or you can say uh, patient uh, database sort of, uh, so that it becomes then easier. If I have a good patient database, then possibly would be able to identify the potential patient from the record or from the database itself. Identifying patients using hospital-based registries or other databases, electronic alerts to physicians, about the uh, clinical trials available to specific patients, electrical, uh, uh, electronic alert to uh, clinical trial staff about eligible patient appointments, promoting clinical research through social media, such as Facebook or Twitter, promoting recruitment through social media, such as Facebook or Twitter, deploying a mobile health unit or mobile research unit, recruiting through public events, such as markets or fairs, etc. Now, some of these, not necessarily all of them are, would be culturally acceptable in our setting yet. And we are possibly not really uh, trying all these simultaneously, particularly in our uh, country. But then time has come when I think we should have some courage to go into these uh, recruitment practices to be in place, whereby the chances of success of uh, in getting enough number of patients getting enrolled in our uh, projects will be relatively more. But at the same time, we have to uh, keep a balance of the, the, the application of the ethical standards also to be otherwise embedded into all such activities. In our uh, recruitment drive, we should not try to do anything which otherwise puts some kind of portion or some kind of, um, uh, some kind of uh, uh, un unacceptable kind of incentive Okay, uh, which otherwise ethically is not acceptable. The reasons for patients declining trial participant offer in our uh, country, uh, which otherwise in, during this pre-screening, okay, we should try. That may be tried by the different treating physicians or the recruiting officers. Uh, some of the common uh, reasons for which patients decline might be, particularly the informed patients, might be because of fear of side effects of the product, loss of control, like discomfort with the idea of randomization, use of placebo, loss of control over, he, over the disease which he or she is suffering from. Okay, if I participate in the clinical trial, I would be bound by the uh, protocol and the norms that are already set in the protocol. So I cannot take a, a decision all by myself once I have agreed. So that kind of perception or that kind of feeling might also prevent me from taking a decision that to participate in a trial. There are logistic challenges also, the perceived inconvenience about need to invest additional time and effort. The costs are also sometimes concerns, concerns about keeping insurance coverage and additional costs. This is also another serious area. So many of our trial participants who are otherwise having a medical insurance, uh, so many a times, uh, they are not informing their insurance company that they are participating in a trial because uh, the insurance company will not take it in a very sporting manner. And uh, at a later point of time, if there is a genuine, uh, genuine uh, demand on the part of the insured person, uh, the, the insurance company can, may, may refuse to oblige because they will say that this was not in the uh, in our terms and conditions, and you have taken in a otherwise unduly risky endeavor of participation in a clinical trial. And uh, so there might be these issues. And these are some issues which uh, needs to be uh, more transparent discussion on these issues and how to deal with such issues. In my experience, what I have seen most of the time, the investigator does not uh, like to keep it uh, very transparent. and. Uh, when uh, anybody would try to discuss this, that what's, whether, whether I have to also intimate my insurance company. 
So usually it is not uh, this, such kind of this thing is discouraged because in that case the insurance company will say no and will be losing that particular participant. Coming to the next phase after the recruitment, assuming that uh, sufficient number of patients are recruited and they have come to my center and I am the investigator, my job is to uh, put uh, the patient into screening or the potential participant into screening. The uh, screening process and there is usually a long list of inclusion and exclusion criteria, which is a good number of them would be based on the history just by discussing with the patient. There will be some which will be based on clinical examination and there will be still some which will be lab based, laboratory test based. So all these uh, processes are to be completed, the screening processes and all the inclusion criteria are to be otherwise fulfilled and all the exclusion criteria are to be, are to be uh, uh, also considered uh, while, while uh, taking a decision whether uh, labeling somebody to be screen eligible. So, uh, and that is also a hurdle. Uh, particular challenges relating to the screening is unduly long laboratory turnaround time for an acute disease. Say for instance, we are doing, we have some experience in this. We are doing a falciparum malaria trial and we all know the uh, nature of falciparum malaria as a disease that which can turn into more severe kind of malaria. Uncomplicated falci falciparum can turn into uh, complicated or cerebral malaria in just a few hours. So uh, in this kind of a trial, uh, the diagnosis of falciparum malaria can be done easily by microscopy. But uh, in order to uh, get, an, uh, get an idea about eligibility of the uh, person, whether the, he would be eligible to take part in the trial, uh, it may require some four or five hours or six hours or seven hours. So until the laboratory reports come, we cannot initiate the treatment and if you are only giving paracetamol to the patient. And uh, this may cause problem. Okay? Uh, the nature of the disease calls for urgency in initiating treatment, but then as per the protocol, you have to wait for uh, so many hours and you are denying the right of the patient to get the specific treatment. Okay? Uh, many a times the complex and burdensome screening procedures, they are also pose special challenges. Uh, handling screen failures is also a, another obligation of the investigator and the site. Uh, routine screening might make unexpected diagnosis. Like say, for instance, we, we, we often would be doing uh, the hepatitis B or the HIV routine screening. And then um, if, you, if you come across somebody who is hepatitis positive, uh, B positive or HIV positive, then it becomes our ethical obligation also to take care of these people, not just giving them the flatly the uh, diagnosis and forget about it. So ethically also that may not be sound. And that can also impact on uh, the, uh, the, the uh, further course of the action as the investigator. Coming to the next uh, step, and that is informed consent, which we know that it's a multi-step process that involves the investigator providing adequate information to potential study participants. Uh, facilitating understanding of the information by the participants, allowing uh, the free decision making by the participant and voluntary consenting by the participant or not consenting uh, for participation and proper documentation of, of the consenting process. So this is what is informed consent and we all know it is such a very important uh, ethical aspect, ethical issue. Uh, in conduct of clinical trial and uh, documentation is extremely, extremely important. And uh, many a times uh, uh, it, it may so happen that uh, otherwise, uh, if it is really informed and if it is really well understood, uh, many a times um, uh, patients uh, will not really agree to take part. Uh, and uh, sometimes the patient will, will require uh, to, to get this also discussed with other members of the family. Uh, and in that case, the process may, may delay. The process or the decision of uh, the patient, whether or not he would participate, may uh, get postponed to the next day or so. And uh, the protocol otherwise uh, might not be allowing that, depending on the design and the type of the disease that being, is being tested, okay? So this is also another issue. Informed consent related issues are also there, which can delay, which can cause uh, 
uh, attrition in the in the uh, uh, enrollment of patients. Next is of course enrollment. When you talk of enrollment, it is the process of getting the consenting subject registered or entered into the clinical trial. As you know, that the moment the anybody is giving his consent and signing the consent form, he is in the trial. And that being in the trial is actually entering into the trial or get, getting registered with the trial. And then uh, this is this process is called enrollment. Only an enrolled patient will be randomized. Sometimes, particularly in case of central randomization, there might be also some uh, uh, some kind of hassle. And uh, when the time between the enrollment and the time actual time of randomization and administration of the medicine, that may delay again for some technical reasons for availability of the uh, investigation and product. Okay, particularly when there is. Uh, there is competitive enrollment going on and there is central randomization process, etc. So that becomes also a critical issue. Coming to the next phase and that is randomization, which is the process of allocating participants to treatment groups at random. So that every participant has an equal chance of getting any of the two or more treatment interventions. Now here we have tried to demonstrate by this simple cartoon where you say out of the sample population, you, as if you are using a dice, but truly speaking, these days we uh, use the random number table and there are different uh, processes of randomization, computer generated ran randomization uh, uh, schemes, which are applied and whereby the patient is allocated uh, treatment, uh, taste treatment or the comparator treatment. Uh, and then we follow them up to for the outcome. So that's what is randomization. And we know that in the randomization process, there is uh, uh, the allocation and then the uh, counseling, the uh, allocation, both are important. And uh, otherwise, the whole purpose of randomization for eliminating bias is, will be lost. Now, here you see that randomization itself is a huge issue, particularly in term, as a participation barrier. If you think about it from the standpoint of the patient who has just found out these cells of, in their body are out of control, as it happens in case of cancer for that matter, you have lost the normalcy of your life. You want to grab hold a hold of something that is going to give you control. Then you talk about randomization. We have done focus groups and patients hate randomization and don't really see the need for it. That means that when you talk of randomization, there is only 50% chance if there are two arms that you get the uh, already tested standard treatment or the uncertain taste treatment or the taste treatment vis-a-vis -vis the placebo treatment, which is almost like no treatment. So these are the areas where the patient may not be comfortable. The patient may expect that why not me being treated by the established standard therapy, even if I'm participating in a trial. So uh, the very issue of randomization can put off an otherwise willing participant at that point of time. And they may uh, uh, withdraw the consent and uh, may opt not to participate in the trial. And finally, about retention, one word, one word about retention. Retention is the strategy that aims to prevent or minimize dropout by the participant. Now, this cartoon very nicely uh, also highlights the, uh, the, the, the approach which may tend to actually prevent uh, uh, the lack of retention or which will, which will catalyze the retention process. Uh, the, these two hands, uh, this, green, this blue one is the side staff and the yellow one is the uh, participant. And you see uh, one hand of the participant and one hand of the star, side staff, they are shaking hands. So that means uh, the bottom line is that in order to facilitate good retention, uh, there should be constant close uh, rapport between the participant and the uh, and the site staff investigator or the core site coordinator or other staff so that only is the key to uh, uh, to successful retention of the study participants until the end of the study uh, so optimizing recruitment in trials it, it has been a, been a goal in uh, by most of the sponsors uh, and this is the focus of 
lot of of strategic research also that goes in uh, in identifying the areas where we can try to actually optimize recruitment uh, there are different strategies that have been tried out and uh, recommended like engaging patients in steering the trial conduct and people have said that why don't you have a steering committee trial conduct steering committee which should be also represented by a uh, patient of uh, a potential participant okay or in the in the same therapeutic area same uh, indication group one patient should be uh, otherwise or patient representative should be also there in that committee so that means as we have stated that we are not supposed to conduct trials on patients we we conduct trials with patients so this kind of steering committee will actually uh, showcase that we are interested in conducting the trial with patients then the question of outreach later to the participant to a potential participant and uh, drafting a participant brochure which will be distributed well ahead of the uh, screening procedure or as a part of the recruitment process so outreach letter addressed to the particip potential participant and a brochure information brochure for the participant what is this trial about in very simple language and uh, mentioning all the critical areas next is uh, referring physician outreach letter and incentive so outreach letter not just for a potential participant outreach uh, letter for the physician from whom we are expecting the physician would be referring his patient for participation in this trial for consideration for participation in the trial and there could be also some kind of incentive for the refer referring physician should also be considered people have tried that also so actually speaking they these physicians they become uh, remote uh, members okay uh, extended members of the trial team or it's a wider network of physicians so they are also uh, catalyzing the process of enrollment okay by agreeing to refer their patients and before they refer their patients it is their duty to also pre screen and also have a preliminary dialogue with the a uh, potential patient who might participate in the trial and then refer such patients when the actual screening will be done at the uh, trial site the next is about the study design and the impact of the study design on participation when you talk of the study design you have to remember that the study today's time uh, the design or the protocol should be patient centric so it should always uh, consider that how it is uh, it can actually ease enrollment process and it should not be unduly too complex uh, which will otherwise not favor uh, adequate enrollment or optimum enrollment particularly these are the four things that we should keep in mind how much time it demands time means patient's time how much time intensivities from the perspective of the patient uh, transport facilities uh, where from the patient is coming and how the patient is getting transported to the site uh treatment what kind of treatment the patient is going to get if he participates in the trial and whether the patient is enough convinced that he is right to get the uh, proper treatment appropriate treatment is otherwise respected and uh, particularly the uh, to what extent there is uh, the patient has to otherwise we are uh, additional troubles because because of agreeing to participate in the trial so uh, these are the things that we have to consider and accordingly we should take measures uh, not just at the last moment at the site so many of the solutions would, would lie actually upstream when the protocol is being designed so during that time if it is possible you should also involve the invest potential investigators the treating physicians and also the patients representatives while the study protocol is being designed or the study is being designed okay so uh, these concepts or these recommendations or suggestions are also coming up you know in optimizing recruitment trials and uh, lastly it is said that keep the design as simple as possible okay that is enough for at finding answer to the research question and look for participants close to the site okay instead of remotely located participants the chances of follow up would be low in that case and uh, chances of drop out will be more so look for participants close to the site keep it simple and close to the site
Now, in simple language, uh, somebody said that uh, the only way to recruit patients on a clinical trial reliably is if the treating clinician believes in the trial. So that is extremely, extremely important. The treating clinician, and when we say this, we, we do not believe that the treating clinician has to be investigated always. Ideally, ethically, it is better if the treating clinician and the trial investigator are two different persons. Okay. There are two different persons and the treating physician is supposed to talk to the patient about the trial okay, in clear terms and during the pre-screening phase as we have stated during the recruitment phase. So this is otherwise a very simple statement. The only way to recruit patients on a trial reliably is if the treating physician, treating clinician believes in the trial, then only he will refer such a patient and he has to talk to the patient clearly about the trial then the chances of withdrawal will be much less. Uh, site selection is also a big issue, is a very important issue for uh, success in enrollment. Uh, when you talk of site, there are broadly, we can classify them into two types of sites, one research optimized site and the non-research focused site. There might be a hospital who, in whose agenda research is not on a, a top priority. And there are hospitals in, in which the research is a, a very important agenda. So uh, the, the research optimized sites, they usually have a rich experience in trial conduct and through their experience they know and they develop their own uh, uh, standard procedures, how to, how to optimize recruitment, how to ensure more enrollment, how to minimize the dropout rates, et cetera. And at a given time, uh, research optimized site has uh, more open trials, more trial of, more offers, trial offers are with, with them. On the other hand, non-research focused site has less experience in trial conduct and fewer open clinical trials. The research optimized site has dedicated personnel, research personnel, and a systematic process for pre-screening patients for trial eligibility. This is usually lacking in non-research focused site. And research optimized site is also have dedicated staff to help with the enrollment process, which is not there in the non-research focused site. So naturally then the sponsor will always look for a site which has already some good experience in trial conduct and in, in which institution research is at a, is a priority agenda. So uh, the chances of uh, better recruitment and better enrollment and uh, acceptable uh, dropouts will be, will be uh, with, with such kind of sites. So site selection, feasibility, site feasibility becomes a very, very important uh, step in ensuring uh, better uh, ensuring success in, in uh, clinical trial by optimizing recruitment and uh, retention. Now, this is a slide which has tried to give a bird's eye view of the framework for strategic recruitment planning. And they have said that uh, uh, this upstream uh, mechanisms of trial design and protocol designing at the sponsors level, okay, prior to the things that reach the trial site. But at the trial site also, there are a uh, lot many steps, a lot many issues that can also help in the process of recruitment. And finally, uh, downstream, the recruitment communication planning is also very, very important. How at the trial site we plan, how to communicate with the trial participants, okay, uh, potential trial participants. And when they are uh, coming to the trial site, how would, what is the quality of dialogue we are getting engaged with? What is the procedure that is followed during the informed consent process? All these will determine even when we have randomized the patient, even after that, how closely we are in touch with the patient, that will also minimize the chances of dropouts. So uh, this is what they say that upstream and downstream uh, strategies for optimizing recruitment. Thank you very much. This is what I thought that I will share. But this is an area, I think, in India, we up till today, we have given uh, less importance to these issues. We only straight away go to a potentially uh, good site and leave everything to them without giving enough opportunity. I think a lot of support from the sponsor is also re required in order to have a good recruitment planning be in place in the, uh, in the, uh, at, the at the research sites itself. So we should also give sufficient time. So if the sponsor is interested, a trial to be started maybe three months down the line or six months down the line, this is the right time you can approach the 
site not that you identify try to find the uh, select the site today and next month you will be starting the trial or initiating the trial and particularly when it is a competitive enrollment okay in a multi center study uh, this experience site will hardly get an opportunity to enroll enough number of patients okay uh, so we should give sufficient time to the site for the recruitment process uh, many of us in the site might not have a very clear distinction or clear idea about the distinction between recruitment and enrollment these are two absolutely uh, two different steps that occur sequentially first it is recruitment and then screening and then consenting then enrollment and then randomization then recruitment. so we have to keep that in mind in that order and accordingly prepare ourselves for a good recruitment strategy to be in place so that we succeed in in uh, economizing the uh, trial conduct in our own setting thank you very much i would be very happy to uh, take a few questions over thank you Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Tripathi, uh, for your comprehensive and uh, lucid, lucid presentation. Uh, I think it was a treat to listen to the various uh, aspects uh, of, uh, you know, uh, recruitment, uh, randomization, and retention of participants, which is a major worry for most of the investigators uh, who uh, pursue, uh, who. Uh, you know, embark on uh, conducting a clinical trial. Uh, if we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, Sir, actually, we are running short of time. So we'll take okay. your uh, permission. Uh, if there are some questions, I am requesting the delegates to put it in the chat box. And sir, is there, sir, can answer those questions in the chat box, sir. OK, yes. perfectly yes, fine. Thank you. So sir, in that case, uh, I thank uh, Professor Tripathi and uh, over to Dr. Shambhu. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shantanu Kumar Tripathi, sir. Thank you, Professor Shoilendro Handu, sir, and Professor Lubha Mudra Chaudhary, madam. So we, are, we have to move to, our, to, to the next session. And to have ch uh, as chairperson, we have, we have two uh, prolific physicians in their respective field. One is Professor Kali Pattanayam from uh, Sri Jagannath Medical College uh, at Puri, the government medical college in Puri. So he is the professor of pharmacology, professor and head of department of pharmacology there. And he is uh, also a very uh, noted practicing physician in Kotak, Bhubaneswar and Puri. So welcome Professor Kali Pattanayak sir. And also we are really proud to have Professor Partho Sharuti Karmokar. Sir is a prolific practitioner and he is also the Professor of General Medicine at Sagotatto Medical College and Hospital. And he is also the General Secretary of API West Bengal chapter and welcome, sir, in this academic event. Now, over to Professor Partho Sharuti Karmakar and Professor Kali Pottanayak, sir. Thank you, Dr. Shambo. Should I start, sir, Professor Pottanayak? Yes. Okay. So can you I could... introduce the speaker? Okay. Should I introduce or you will introduce? Yes, sir. Let me introduce and you will conclude the session. Okay, thank you. So, the topic for today is importance of site development for enabling research. And as we know, the site, I think it is uh, for clinical trial research. So, we know that for clinical trial research, there should be an IEC which should be registered under DCGI. The investigators should be thorough on GCP and clinical trial rules of 2019 and should be infrastructure. And I congratulate the organizers for choosing this topic on the International Clinical Trial Day 
thanks dr sambhu for inviting me as chairperson and to speak on the topic dr sanis dabis who is a md and dm in clinical pharmacology research and director janson pharmaceuticals he is the president of indian society for clinical research clinical pharmacologist by training over 15 years of experience in pharmaceutical industry and his passion is for clinical research educational philanthropy i welcome dr sanish davis and hand over the dais to speak on the topic and i request my co chair person ps karmakar to conclude this is dr sanish davis please thank you organizers and uh, thank you uh, respected chairpersons for the kind introduction uh, with your permission i will uh, at my presentation and i am conscious that we are running a bit short of time so uh, my topic is on the importance of site development for enabling research uh, and uh, what i uh, would want to kind of like see in india is to see research super sites and i will talk about what that means in the next couple of slides let me start by a recent uh, uh, incident that happened uh, for one of our uh, programs and that is actually poignant of what uh, and the reason why a country like india needs to have research super sites a well known senior politician was admitted with an advanced stage of cancer in one of the well known medical colleges in india uh, unfortunately for the gentleman the only option left for him was to participate in a clinical trial uh, with a compound which was in uh, late stage development and uh, the nearest study site unfortunately was 300 kilometers away obviously uh, the politician uh, his family and kin as well as very senior members of the current political dispensation actually uh, questioned the institution's leadership as to why this big hospital was not even considered for clinical trials even though uh, there were no dearth of uh, you could say seasoned and well qualified uh, investigators or researchers in the hospital uh, the senior leaders actually reached out to the sponsor to request for this particular institutions to be selected as quickly as possible to be a research site unfortunately Uh, because the selection and other things were all completed there was no possibility for the sponsor to actually agree to open one more site uh, as part of you could say what you could imagine would have been the fallout of all this now the institution is trying to ramp up its research quotient uh, they including hiring a full time research director as well as allocation of dedicated space for clinical research and clinical trials now this is a one off story but is uh, an indicative uh, uh, issue with regards to how clinical research is treated in in india in many ways now uh, my standard disclaimers uh, i will be mainly be focusing on academic institution and what we can do to do better clinical research there or even industry clinical trials there and these are some of the topics that i will cover over the next 20 minutes uh, we'll start with the clinical investigators in india as to what they want uh, participation in regulatory studies uh, this is a good way to develop your site your department your institution and ultimately the question is that if all these things have to happen what is in it for the investigator or the department or institution to develop into a research site or to developing into an institution where a lot of research is naturally being attracted and then of course i will tie in this with how uh, globally uh, an institution is looked at for research it's not just the pharmaceutical industry research which actually determines whether more studies or more research comes to the institution there are a host of other things which which are there and we'll summarize and of course have discussion so the journey for medical uh, person in india or an investigator in india starts uh, yeah, you could say in a very convoluted way right i mean we go through mbbs 
Uh, many who finish MBBS don't go for higher training and they go for general practice. Uh, for many of us, uh, or maybe 99 percentage of folks in today's time, uh, everyone goes through an entrance exam. You get into MD, MS, or a clinical specialty, or <clears throat> sometimes if you don't get your specialty of choice, you opt for a D, uh, diploma or sometimes a diploma in uh, uh, or a DNB course. And then again, you can uh, go into clinical practice or again go through the entrance examination rigors and go into a MD, DM or MCH and then you enter into clinical practice and uh, the very rare few who actually can stick stick into the academia and within uh, people who are in general practice or in, in, in private practice as we say, there is this very rare breed of individuals who actually wants to develop into uh, clinical researchers, not only doing industry studies, but also doing their own research work uh, in, in those private institutions. And within academy, of course, now with the requirement for, uh, you could say, research publications, etc., for your career advancement, there is, of course, a lot more interest in uh, medical institutions or government institutions to actually uh, uh, have research as a key theme. Uh, and then within academy also, there is, again, this rare breed who becomes a physician scientist. These are physicians or clinicians who actually also do research as a significant part of their, uh, you could say, day-to-day -day work. And, and these are the people that we need to kind of like keep uh, motivating for uh, higher goals. Now, uh, the question uh, that many of us uh, who have been in medical institution will always have is why do research at all? So, uh, a, and a clinician of course performs the quadruple functions of patient care, teaching, administration and research. It's a key driver for satiating the intellectual curiosity uh, in, in clinicians and doctors. And of course, good research contributes to evidence-based medicine, which means that uh, it informs better patient care and ultimately it promotes, uh, you could say, the national goals of health for all, etc. cetera. Uh, but on the other hand, you have all the barriers that are there uh, in our country which actually makes uh, uh, doing research, uh, you could say, a difficult task. Uh, first and foremost is the lack of recognition for researchers, right? If you are a clinician and you are a researcher, or if you are in the medical institution and you are a researcher, uh, and sometimes not even your institutional head or sometimes even your department head does not give you any weightage, right? And that can be a big, big, uh, you could say, a demotivator or a letdown for uh, researchers who want to do research. Uh, the other thing is, of course, because of the labor-intensive task that goes into research, and sometimes it takes months or years to uh, uh, reach fruition for the research that you start, uh, people get demotivated there too. We don't have the concept of protected time for research. Uh, and many people who actually juggle this uh, with a lot of elan uh, actually have a lot of challenges both in their personal lives as well as in their professional life. So how, do, how can institutions actually nurture this uh, requirement? Uh, and honestly, research is not everyone's cup of tea. If uh, somebody asked this question to me 20 years back, um, I would have said that I would rather do clinical practice and not do any research. Uh, but over a period of time, things have actually changed. Environments has changed. There is much better exposure to postgraduates as well as uh, uh, super, specialized, uh, super specialty training uh, folks to actually get exposed to more and more research and, and probably look at this as a good career uh, uh, option. Uh, lack of support systems in the hospitals can be a, a, a big letdown, especially infrastructure, uh, administrative support, uh, all these kind of like make things very difficult. And uh, many researchers who are starting out actually have a lack of mentors, uh, good mentors who can actually handhold them, uh, give them support. Uh, when things don't go well, uh, speak a good word to the administration for them, etc. So you, you need a lot of mentorship in order to come up uh, in research. And, and I actually look at, uh, you could say, people uh, or clinicians who do research and put them into four buckets. Uh, one is the set of investigators or researchers who have a very well set up establishment. And many a times this is in the private setting where uh, they know the value of data. 
data is the oil, as we say, uh, and and they know how to actually do this like a business venture. Uh, what is in it for them is more of networking, advisory boards, travel that comes with, etc. Second is who are willing to do or doing research, but patient care is primary. Uh, they are in it because uh, if they are not there, I think they will miss out on the science part of it and, of course, the other perks that come with it. Uh, the third, academicians are mainly uh, those in the uh, institutions which are in government setting. Many a times it is due to peer pressure or local effects. You want to be part of uh, publications. You want to be part of cutting edge research, and that's where you're primarily there. And the last is uh, clinical departments where the PI is the head of the department and has delegated all this responsibility to junior staff. So, uh, of course, the junior staff has to do this because there is a dictum in the department which says that you have to manage all the research work. So, uh, this would be a general understanding of where uh, researchers staff. Now, if I actually put uh, or rather tie in the overall ambitions of the country, and why uh, site development or research development is such an important thing. Uh, we'll have to take a little bit of a step back uh, and uh, think about what the government of India has done uh, immediately in the post-COVID setting. Uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has been a big eye-opener for uh, uh, the government with regards to how our institutions have to develop, how our institutions have to be aligned to research, et cetera. We have great institutions which bring out compounds and uh, drugs, but uh, we have dearth of institutions and seasoned investigators who can actually be advisors for this research activity who have done translational research and, and can say that, okay, what is the best way to approach this, et cetera. So the government's motto of make in India and to have India as an R&D hub uh, um, means that there has to be sites and others which can actually uh, take up this challenge. Uh, investments in R&D in pharmaceuticals have increased by the government as well as by non-government organizations. Uh, there are several funding agencies which are increasing efforts to develop these networks of uh, sites which can actually do cutting edge research like from BIRAC, DBT, ICMR and others. But these networks won't be successful unless there is continuous inflow of studies and these are both academic and industry related. And uh, unless it, uh, it happens, many of these sites will actually kind of like regress and some will even, uh, you could say, stop being uh, sites at all. Uh, so discoveries in Indian labs, which, are, which need to undergo translation uh, needs two kinds of stuff. One is, of course, dedicated sites for doing these kind of studies. And of course, people or clinical researchers who are experienced in uh, developing these kind of compounds. And I'll give you two examples of where we found uh, these kind of challenges. One was uh, when we were actually developing a drug for rheumatoid arthritis in one of my earlier assignments with an Indian R&D company. And, and we were actually looking out for feedback on what kind of, uh, uh, you could say, studies should we be doing, how do we actually uh, decide on endpoints, etc. And I was speaking to one of the very famous uh, rheumatologists in India, and uh, the, the feedback that we received was absolutely of no use to us. And the reason for that is because uh, the, the gentleman was only be able to kind of like say things from his clinical practice perspective, whereas drug development is a different ball game altogether. Uh, similarly, I think uh, we have the current story of CAR T uh, development. CAR T is, uh, you could say, the new treatment paradigm for many of the oncology conditions. Uh, if India has to develop CAR T, you need sites which are dedicated, which have ICU set up and others where these kind of studies can be done. Um, if, whether it is multinational studies or whether it is India-led studies, we need to have sites which have these kind of experiences and dedicated researchers who will be there. And that won't come with without actually being part of, you could say, uh, be, uh, being uh, part of some of the studies which are either industry sponsored or big academic, uh, uh, you could say studies which are sponsored by, uh, you could say trusts or other institutions like the NIH, et cetera. So the ultimate aim would be to support the make in India story. 
and not only that make an india for the world because that's where the government wants india to be as a innovative r and d hub uh, into the future now moving to the next thing uh, uh, the question of why do uh, you could say clinical trials because that is ultimately uh, going to be the driver for doing lot more studies in in the world uh, and and especially in india there are a lot of reasons but i would say these four reasons would be what would be of interest to uh, people who are actually wanting to develop their sites further uh, you get spin off ideas you get topics for postgraduate thesis sometimes you get funding uh, for the department to run studies or research which is important for you and that is the key for many of the researchers or many of the sites or institution that pharmaceutical industry research is just a means to an end what is more important is that it gives you that leverage or leeway to actually run your own studies for uh, your own work but of course there are uh, challenges too uh, there are responsibilities that come with this and uh, Uh, investigators and sites have to be developed in order to actually get to that role and of course we as an industry also requires a lot of uh, support from the academia or from uh, institutions because uh, that is where patients are we would rather place complex studies in academic settings uh, rather than in a small private setting even though uh, the investigator might be the best uh, person uh, that is there because you have a chain of command to oversee patient management etc similarly more complex studies which require lot more effort from the institution would better be placed in uh, these kind of well developed uh, sites in the academic uh, institutions now what is there for uh, institutions and others so uh, for the patients of course it's like uh, uh, being part of some of these unmet medical needs etc for researchers it is opportunity to be part part of cutting edge research as well as to kind of like change even their treatment practices and for sponsors as i said it is uh, the patients and and those who are coming uh many a times uh industry sponsored research can be run synergistically with academic research and that's the reason why sites can develop more more of their uh, systems their processes uh, even their study teams because without your study teams uh, you will not be able to survive much more in research so the more number of studies that come to you as a research site the more that you can hire people who can actually be participants as your study team uh, that of course also brings uh, the requirement for overseeing etc and i will just leave it with uh, two examples uh, from st johns in bangalore where uh, they initially started with some of those studies uh, industry studies and then uh, because of the large number of studies that they're doing they were able to also do more of academic research and similarly dr mohan uh, uh, where he was part of several of the industry studies but ultimately he could channelize many of these funding etc into research which is important for the site uh, from a diabetes perspective uh, for the hospital leadership uh, you need to get your administrators also on your side uh, how do they actually benefit from them one is they can actually advertise this as an opportunity for patients that you have options with us because we are part of several of these studies and you will get alternative uh, treatments that are available sometimes research certification or accreditation of your institution can offer more credibility internationally so you become a super site you you have systems processes etc that also makes patients uh, who are even internationally placed to actually say that i would like to be treated there because they do more research they are treating patients well patient safety is a big differentiator etc uh you can be uh, easily be recognized as a partner or a collaborator like for example even if industry runs some of these studies uh the feedback on which countries to go which sites to select all come from big institutions which are in the us or europe or japan etc uh, common examples are uh, duke's uh, research center uh, the nih uh, folks etc they actually say which centers to go in india uh, even for pharmaceutical industry research so it it 
it makes it better for you to be a research super site where you're doing uh, not only industry uh, studies, but also academic study. And apart from that, you also have human resource development as well as a good revenue stream that comes up. Coming to my last part, which is how uh, we actually, uh, you could say, select uh, uh, sites. Uh, and, and this is, a uh, you could say, a good way to actually think about site development. Uh, India in India, regulatory agency requires that you have uh, equal number of academic and government medical institutions as part of your study, uh, and that actually gives a good uh, uh, requirement for developing medical institutions as big sites. Uh, similarly, there is a requirement for a geographical mix for sites. You have you need to have good amount of sites even from the east. Uh, we believe that there are well-qualified institutions and investigators in the eastern part of India. There are some challenges with regards to custom and sometimes even uh, some of the ICF language requirements, which can become deterrents, but they are not you could say a big barrier uh, at this point in time. Uh, we also look at some of these other things and uh, several things which actually uh, enables, uh, you could say sponsors to select sites again and again. And hence these sites becoming the preferred sites as one, of course, your ongoing studies and the performance there, availability of a well, uh, good site staff. Uh, the investigator might be a, a key opinion leader or a big person, but if he doesn't have a good research staff, many times we don't actually uh, select those sites. Uh, so that's again, another reason for developing uh, a, yourself into a good site so that you can attract more and more uh, studies that are there. For the hospital's research leadership, uh, they need to actually invest in uh, developing databases, uh, even developing an investigator's database with their interest areas. That, that is the first place sometimes uh, sponsors actually go and look for uh, uh, whether we can actually go with the site or not. And then, of course, uh, some of the other things which are important. Uh, a, a good site should also look at uh, maybe having a clinical research secretariat. This is for the institution in order to become a, a, become a super site. Uh, it not only enables uh, good management, but there is also a good central oversight or compliance that can happen uh, with this kind of a clinical research site uh, that is there. So to summarize, developing sites for research is a win-win for everyone. Discoveries in the Indian labs require not only experienced researchers, but also capable sites for translation of those discoveries into products which can ultimately be used by patients. Participating in industry-sponsored studies enables the larger goals of sites and institutions to do what, what research they think uh, makes a difference to patients. And site development leads to further opportunities for enhancing overall patient care, providing education of trainees and postgraduates, and also brings in much needed revenue for you could say, enhancing uh, the patient experience, et cetera. So with that, thank you once again, uh, 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 the organizers and uh, Dr. Shambo, uh, making research an agenda for your institution is something uh, which uh, I strongly believe in. And uh, we would like to see more of institutions uh, actually developing as super sites in India and uh, all the very best. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davis, for your very excellent lucid and comprehensive speech on importance of site development in enabling research work. Really, it was very informative and uh, you have really said the right thing that uh, so far our research work is concerned in academic institute. Uh, we should uh, really uh, promote this thing in our institute too. And we are really happy to know from your end that you are uh, appreciating the research work what is going on in Eastern part of India uh, you are uh, you are really satisfied with your that statement, and you have rightly said that COVID has really become an eye opener so far in judging ourselves. So far, our dedicated researchers' stand is concerned, or our infrastructure for development, new medicines or new uh, vaccination, whatever it, new vaccines, whatever it may be. Uh, we have, I think, we have uh, successfully tied over the crisis, medical crisis that appeared in last couple of years. So uh, really, we are very much thankful for your excellent deliberation. 
and i don't know whether uh, our organizers will allow us to have discussions on one or two questions if there is any dr shambo sir actually we are running short of time so yeah, we yeah. have to move towards the next session sir okay so, thank you and thank, thank you from you. my end as well as from our coach coach yeah. for skills in dr fortana we are very much thankful to the whole organizing organizing team of indian pharmacological society especially to dr shambo for allowing us to share this beautiful session. okay thank you very much thank you thank professor you. thank thank you professor ps karmakar sir thank you professor uh, kali prasad patnaik sir and uh, we are really thankful to dr shanish devis for presenting this very important topic and he had uh, given us a challenge because yes we are a little bit behind this eastern part of india and we have professors like shantanu tripathi professor krishnam shure is there professor ps karmakar from api from uh, the professor kali pottanayak Prof professor trupti swain we need to have some collaborative approach and we need your help that is indian society of clinical research along with our uh, indian pharmacological society west bengal chapter also we can uh, collaborate with api west bengal chapter so so that we can have a collaborative approach and we can build something in eastern part of india too thank you once again thank you uh, we have to move towards the next session we are running short of time uh, already we are 40 minutes behind so it is a really privilege for us to have for the next session professor of professors professor urmila thatte madam uh, who is a renowned professor of clinical pharmacology and uh, he is a well uh, she is a well known figure uh, we must appreciate uh, madam welcome to this uh, e forum and also we have professor krishnam shure who is a very important and very we can say uh, father figure of indian pharmacological uh, society west bengal chapter for long time sir was president past president of indian pharmacological society west bengal chapter so i am welcoming professor krishnam shure also to chair the next session over to madam and sir uh, thank you thank you uh... Uh, Shambhu for inviting me here. It's a big honor and a pleasure to be with you all, people. I know you all for a long time now, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I think I will request Dr. Ray to make the introduction of the speaker. To sir, will you begin? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thatte. As uh, as told to. speak on thing something about the preliminary aspects of this today's topic that is uh, that is your uh, interim analysis as you know that data analysis means uh, basically it's uh, cleansing reporting modifying and so many things to do particularly the interim analysis sometimes on an ongoing trial uh, it is required for some purposes particularly to make some decision making Uh, due to uh, some modification of the conduct of the study now there are four objectives mainly as you know uh, to re estimate the sample size the necessity to modify an option to stop the trial and option to continue the trial there are many methods and there are some so many logics uh, before doing this interim analysis as you know about we should be free from conflicts of interest and that should be done by an independent scientist then there should be a scientific sound scientific reasoning for taking this decision of interim analysis and good performance metrics are required so all these things will be taken up by our learned speaker dr pawan singh uh, dr singh uh, is a senior medical director of biocon biologics and he had a standing in the profession he did his mbbs from gs medical college and did his clinical pharmacology md dm from pg chandigarh previously worked with glen marks and pharma dr reddies so on and so forth many publications he has in his credit and his area of interest is clinical pharmacology and clinical development particularly in the field of diabetes pain management immune oncology and biosimilars so uh, we are looking forward to listen from dr singh and once dr singh will finish i'll request madam thatte to conclude the session and sum up and ask and, and inviting the questions if there is any thank you very much dr pawan singh please 
yeah thank you thank you sir and thank you ma'am uh, so to be honest we have learned a lot from all of you uh, Thakte madam actually has taught us also the clinical pharmacology and it's a great opportunity to present in a session where she is sharing uh, before beginning i would like to thank uh, dr shambhu and the whole uh, ips uh, west bengal chapter for giving me this opportunity and uh, i am sharing my screen before starting uh, so, Dr. Shambhu, can you confirm it's visible to you? Yes, sir. It is visible. Okay. So, Dr. Shambhu has given me the responsibility to talk about interim analysis in clinical trial. And to be honest, uh, Professor Ray, sir, uh, you have already covered the, everything what I am going to uh, talk about. Only I will go in, into some more depth. And as you rightly said, most of this is a logical thing. And to support that logic, we have the statistical principles, ethical principles, and scientific principles uh, to take a call on interim analysis in clinical trials. Uh, I will try to stick with the timelines, Dr. Shambhu, uh, and not try to go beyond my allotted 20 minutes. I will try to finish it before that. So this is just a disclaimer. Every industry person gives that uh, opinion will be personal attribute to my me and not uh, given to my organization. So I will start with this uh, very uh, logical question. Why you want uh, to do an interim analysis? Because uh, during the conceptualization stage of any study, you forethought each and everything, most of the thing, based on whatever the evidence you already have in the form of publications, literature availability, or sometimes the data on file. Then why you want to plan for an interim analysis during the conduct of the uh, clinical trial. So, uh, there are basically three principles on the ba basis of which an interim analysis should be planned. One is ethical, one is scientific, and one is economics. So uh, if you see early stopping normally is done on the basis of safety or harm, and in case of very extreme efficacy or in case of futility, there is no difference. And then based on this, you can uh, adapt the design. This is this data. And then we can have the play the winner and drop the loser kind of design. Uh, we also try to intend to maintain the power and make any adaptation for whatever reason and whether or not data derived while still we want to control the alpha. Now, here I want to emphasize that uh, though interim analysis is done in between, the planning should happen before the start of the trial or the uh, planning stage of the trial itself. Because you have to foresee what are the variables which you don't know at the start of the trial or which may be collected during the trial and which can uh, change your decision points during the conduct of the trial. Now, if everything is known before the start of the trial, interim analysis should not be done. If nothing is known before the trial, you should not plan a full place trial, but better to plan a pilot trial. But in case of in between these two, and most of the time where I am operating, uh, we are more concerned with the CV or the variability, which is known for most of the time the reference product, but not, may not be known for the innovator, uh, our own product or the experimental product. Now, when we calculate the sample size, as uh, Professor A is saying, that uh, it may lead to re-estimation of the sample size. So at the start, we have certain assumptions taken to derive the sample size and in terms of the power of the study. Now, our results at the end will only hold true if that assumptions at the end of the trial are met, whether it is respect to the variability, whether it respect to the alpha, beta, or whatever we have assumed. Now, if that assumptions we are not sure, it's better to have a window of opportunity during the conduct, see whether your assumptions are meeting what you have assumed at the beginning. If not, better to change or adapt. So all this interim analysis basically leads to the adaptation. And then this adaptation can be in the terms of re-estimation of sample size, in the terms of stopping the trial, in the terms of stopping one arm of the trial, or you may want to continue the trial with the enlarged sample size or enlarged uh, period of observation. 
Now, there are certain methods which are defined for the doing interim analysis. So you can have a multi-stage design or seamless transition design. There can be group sequential designs, then stochastic curtailment design. And you can also have the sample size adjustment. And now we are what we are seeing adaptive or flexible design at the beginning itself. Now, with respect to the first part, as a physician, we should always focus on the safety of the subjects which are participating because efficacy may or may not be there, but we cannot compromise with the safety of the participant. And as per the health signal declaration also, physicians should cease any investigation if the hazard or no outweigh the potential benefit, that is primum non no safe. So this is the basic principle on the basis of which independent data safety committee or DSMB committee analyze the data in between. And they can stop the trial if the harm is more than the anticipated benefit. Now trials with serious irreversible endpoints should be stopped in case if one treatment is proven to be superior and as such potential stopping should be formally pre-specified in the trial design itself. Now, this is very, very important that this stopping criteria, especially in that for the uh, superiority or proven to be superior should be predefined in the term of margin and statistics. And it should not be done that uh, during the, when you are do, uh, doing the, uh, seeing the data in the form of DSMB or blinded data, you feel that your treatment is going to be far superior, so better to uh, unblind and see whether you are going to be superior to the uh, completer arm or not, and then to stop. It should never happen. It should always, always be predefined if you want to stop the trial for superiority. Now, coming to the fixed sample size trial versus other trial design. First is the sample size is calculated to detect a given difference at given significance and power. This is how we calculate the sample size and power, we all know. And then the required number of patients are randomized, accrued, and they complete the study. And then at the end, patient outcomes are analyzed and after observation of a pre-specified number of events. This is the traditional way how we conduct our fixed sample size clinical trial and then define whether the trial is passed or failed. Well, compared to this uh, fixed sample size versus uh, sequential trial, here the sample size is again calculated to detect a given difference at a given significance and power. And patients are again accrued until a pre-planned interim analysis of patient outcome takes place. So already we have a predefined period where we are going to do this interim analysis. And based on that, the trial is, can be terminated early, early or the trial can continue without any modification or change. And then again, at the end, patient's outcome are analyzed and after observation of pre specified number of events. Now, compared to this fixed versus sequential trial, in adaptive trial, normally what we do is again, sample size is calculated based on similar principles and patients are accrued until a pre planned interim analysis, based on which again, the trial can be terminated early or the trial continues unchanged now, adaptive trial has a third provision that the trial can continue again with certain modification or adaptations. And then patient outcomes are then analyzed at the end of the trial after observation of a pre-specified or in modified number of events based on the adaptation what we are planning to do. So this slide basically talks about uh, uh, continuation of phase two to phase three trial, also we called it as seamless phase two phase three design. Here we simultaneously screen of several treatment groups with continuation as phase three trial. And for example, in phase two, we can have a multiple arms, arm one, two, three, or more than that, or different dose label. And then rather than stopping the whole trial or continuing the whole trial as such, the adaptation can be only stopping of one or more arm, either Normally, if the arm is known to be futile or it is known to be having a safety problem, then the arm can be dropped and the rest of the arm can be continued cut. Now, in case of seamless transition design, for example, in case of dose selection study, uh, you can have a, a B, C uh, different uh, dose and placebo. 
and then we continue planning and designing the phase three study after getting the phase two results and then uh, we select the most effective dose in phase two and recommended uh, dose for phase three based on phase two results however if we are going for a combined phase two three design we need a, a break point where we do the interim analysis based on that result either we can drop one or two arm or we can continue all the arms throughout and then analyze at the end so it depends on the probability of if we there is a probability that uh, this much arm cannot be continued or one arm has probability of having no uh, effect compared to others then the arm can be dropped now coming to again group sequential trials and the multiple analysis part uh, it's not without any defect or what we called uh, there is uh, some cons also now, if several analyses are carried out, uh, the type 1 error, uh, alpha error is inflated every time this analysis is carried out and the target level of significance. Now, if you are planning an interim analysis, then one must use an adjusted level of significance so that overall type 1 error is preserved at the end of the study. Now, this uh, slide uh, shows about the uh, inflammation uh, inflation with respect to alpha at multiple analysis so as you see the more number of interim analysis or the more number of times we are going to look at the data the alpha is going to inflate for example if at the beginning of the study the alpha is set at 0 0.05 and then we have a uh, three analysis in in between then the alpha will become 0.11. If we have five analysis, it will become 0.15. And as the number of analysis increases, the alpha value keeps on increasing. And to adjust this alpha for multiple analysis, significance level, which is used at the beginning, will have to be lower than uh, what we want to achieve at the end of the study so that the overall probability of alpha will remain 0 0.05. Now coming to the question, how many times we can look the data? So normally not more than one or two interim analysis give, uh, uh, should be planned because it gives the most benefit in terms of reduction and not much gain from going beyond five analysis. Uh, so ideally, it should be anything between two to five, but the recommendation is not to go more than one or two interim analysis in a given trial. Now, when do you want to conduct this interim analysis with respect to the trial? So uh, with error spending alpha, the full flexibility as to number and timing of analysis. But practically first analysis, you know, we should not do too early. So often we try to do it once the 50% of the information is available or 50% of the subjects has complete the randomization. And it is also advised that you equally space this analysis, for example, 50%, 75% or 25, 50 or 75. It should not be that uh, first analysis you do very late and then you frequently keep on looking on the data. And then at the moment you are getting some significance, you stop the track. So it has to be pre-planned and equally spaced. That is what recommended. So the, as a principle, strategy and timing should not be chosen based on the observed result, but it has to be predefined at the strategy level or the planning stage of the trial itself. Now, with respect to who conducts interim analysis, so as Professor Ray already pointed out, it has to be uh, someone who is independent of the study, who don't have any conflict of interest, and most of the time we uh, establish the IDMC or DSMB for this purpose. We can have experts from different disciplines, which include clinicians, statistician, ethicists, patient advocates, etc. They can uh, review the trial conduct as well as safety and efficacy data and can recommend based on the observed data, either stopping the trial, continuing the trial unchanged or continue the trial with certain modifications. Now, uh, this is all I want to share, uh, and I have tried to be very brief uh, in the terms of uh, time saving, to be very honest. Uh, there are many statistical aspects which are required for this interim analysis, which I uh, did not touch uh, deliberately because uh, then it requires a lot of time to go into the 
boundary rules and there, we have a different boundary rules uh, to be defined uh, for interim analysis. So that may be in some other session and, and some other platform. So thank you, thank you very much again. And I am open to have a, a quick uh, suggestion or uh, any quick comments. Dr. Shambhu, over to you. Oh, I think I have to summarize now. Uh, I think that was a very nice talk, very simple, and it gave us just the exact amount of information that one needed to know one or two things, which I think are very important. One is that you need, you can have ethical, scientific, and economic reasons for doing an interim analysis. And I think the second most important thing that I am going to go home with is that if you ever decide to do interim analysis, it should be planned before. It should not be done during the trial. You can't just say, okay, now the results take care, so now we must unblind and do an interim analysis. That is not acceptable because of the alpha spending as you showed us. If people haven't understood the statistics, that's all right, because this is really a very complicated thing. And you should remember that you will always have to have a statistician on the day, on the DSMB who will help you with these procedures. You can't be an expert in everything. So it's okay if you have, uh, somebody has said, no, could not understand. So who, what, what was difficult? Priya Mehta, are you there? If you want to ask any questions, please go ahead. I think we can allow one question. And if someone could not understand, then I am not able to justify with whatever I have said. So I am well, ready I to rectify that. So I guess it's not fair to me for me to say that I understood, but uh, I found it quite simple and you explained quite well. I would let you tell you people to go home with two messages. One is that there are ethical, scientific and uh, economic reasons for doing interim analysis. And the second message that I would like you to go home with is that you cannot have an interim analysis planned during the study. It has to be pre-planned. It has to be defined at the beginning. You have to decide your alpha spending and you have to therefore plan it in advance what you are going to do if you're going to do it. What the results will be, you cannot define now because you don't know the results, but you have to at least plan the analysis. So, so she has asked you, sir, any source to read to understand it better? I have just started MD pharmacology. So can you give some references? Any references which can talk about interim analysis? So, so uh, depending on the pre to be honest, uh, the basic principles of the conduct of the clinical trial and then uh, Dawson and Trap is what we I use. One ICH also talks about it. No? ICH E9 guidelines are there, yeah. uh, talks about, and there are FDA guidance also uh, for interim analysis. But before that, you need to really understand what is alpha, what is beta, how we calculate the sample size. We yeah, understand, we are assuming that that much basics they know. <laughs> no, since so MD first year resident, so I am not sure. Uh, They've done that in uh, community. Right, time. It's, sure. it's time, yeah. She will learn it later. Yeah. But she has to study for it. There are plenty of books on this, uh, for the statistical designing clinical trial. And uh, she can find out from books. These are all elementary things she should know. Okay. okay. Uh, thank okay. you, Pavan, for thank timely you. completing. And this is the best thing. I think you have learned from PGI time management <laughs> and congratulations. You have made it really simpler and the way you are presenting, it has improved and it is now getting better and better with time as your hair starts graying and I'm getting balder. <laughs> right, sir. Thank you, sir, for this comments with the age, the, this things comes naturally. Yeah. And now I am feeling that I'm belonging to that elder group now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, and sir. for everyone, Dr. Pavan is my last student in PJ when we both worked together. He completed in 2012 his DM under me, and I left in 2013. Now I am in Bhuvneshwar. So we had a great association there. Right, sir.
and we are only able to meet uh, in this kind of platforms only. Yeah, so yeah. Thank you, Dr. Shambhu, for allowing yeah. us to speak. <laughs> yeah. So let's move to the next. Yeah. So thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Urmila Thakte, Madam, Professor Krishnan Shure, and Dr. Pawan Singh for this wonderful deliberation. Just with permission of the chair and the uh, speaker, may I share that uh, there is one very uh, beautiful review article in JAPI, that is Journal of Association of Physicians India. Uh, you, you can just uh, click in the Google JAPI, J-A-P-I, then uh, name of Professor Urmila Thatte and Nitta Gokte and interim analysis. You will find one review article and they, that is very useful, I think. You can read that. So with that, we have to move to the next session and we are really privileged to have Professor Debashish Hotasar with us to chair the session who needs actually no introduction. He is a noted clinical pharmacologist and he is the head of the uh, Department of Pharmacology at Ames Bhubaneswar. Welcome you, sir. And also we have Professor Trupti Swine, madam, who also needs no introduction. He She plays a uh, very pivotal role in, uh, in in Indian Pharmacological Society Eastern Zone. So he she is the professor and head of Department of uh, Pharmacology at SCB Medical College. So welcome, madam. So please start next session. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Shambhu, for the introduction. Uh, Debasi, sir, uh, would you yeah. like to come past? I sir? have... Uh... Yeah, very nice association with uh, Professor Usarani. When I visited uh, Nizams some three years back for the MCI inspection, because their DM affiliation was uh, stopped by MCI, I was uh, there to restart the program actually. So that time I saw the level of energy and the level of expertise they have and the way they have developed the department with uh, all thanks to the senior most professor in clinical pharmacology, Professor M.U.R. Naidu. And the department has developed really the perfect, I can say in Indian setup, perfect department of clinical pharmacology. And few of our students also graduated from that institute. And uh, the level of energy and expertise that I was really impressed uh, to something must be learned from Professor Usarani. So she has been uh, the director and she has visited PGI Chandigarh as uh, one of the participants in our clinical trial, uh, this workshop sometime back. Uh, so that time she was uh, probably a junior level faculty. Now she is heading the department and a uh, lot of students are graduating. Of course, we don't know where they are lost actually. They must be visible. And most of her students are placed in many uh, industry, few are in the academia, and, uh, and we really lose track on all of them. The Clinical Pharmacological Association must track them. So this is something we should not miss any one of the people who are graduated from any of the institutes of uh, repute. So over to Madam. And this pragmatic clinical trial that uh, we have been presenting as a DM student or uh, uh, our students, we moderate the topic. This is a real life scenario, how a clinical trial should be effective in producing the expected outcome. Dr. Pawan has mentioned how to calculate the sample size but in real life scenario, what should be the optimal clinical, uh, clinical trial sample size to produce the expected results from a, a new chemical entity to be marketed as a medicine. So Professor Usarani, please to start. Uh, yeah, thank you. I thank the uh, West Bengal chapter, especially Dr. Uh, uh, Shantanu and his team, and of course now Dr. Shambhu, and uh, uh, thanks Dr. Kota for giving such a wonderful introduction, and uh, the co-chair Dr. Trupti. Uh, I think my topic for uh, the session today is on uh, pragmatic clinical trials, and uh, 
this is uh, has sir has just said it is uh, one of the upcoming topics in recent times and it's still nascent but yes interesting so so i will be going uh, the outline of presentation is little about the definition something about the historical aspects what are the core characteristics of a pct and what is the difference between an rct and a pct and a small note on the presses tool a little about the benefits challenges and limitations and then about uh, how this has actually helped during the pandemic and future trends with a small note on the newer oncology drugs so by definition a pragmatic clinical trial is defined as trials which are designed for the primary purpose of of informing decision makers regarding the comparative balance of benefits burdens etc at an individual or population level so what i've highlighted is a little different and little more important and as compared to an rcc it is a comparative balance at an individual or a population level so which means that this is relevant to clinical practice so the research investigations are embedded in the healthcare system and they are relevant to clinical practice so a small note on the historical aspects as early as 1967 we had schwartz and uh, lelock who had first described what is a pragmatic clinical trial and what's an explanatory clinical trial and a couple of decades later there was actually a paper published by yusef et al which is streamlining and simplifying trial designs to enable larger sample size as just now so i was talking about sample size we have a fixed sample size there but here you can have a larger sample size which gives a more reliable estimates of the unbiased assessment and therapies and much much later in 2003 tunis et al they had actually described pragmatic clinical trials as trials for which the hypothesis and the study design are formulated based on information needed to make decision that is it's going to help the decision makers on how to go about further and this is actually in contrast with explanatory clinical trials so what is the difference i'll come a little later before that i just want to give you a little about the core characteristics of prag pragmatic clinical trials so here what happens is the questions from and important to stakeholders are actually taken into account it is not the sponsor deciding on the trial question and formulating the protocol it is from the clinicians or the patients or from where you are going to derive the question so here you are going to have a diverse representative population there are multiple homo multiple heterogeneous settings multiple outcomes which are important uh, for decision making and here you use a comparator just like a real world setting not a placebo or an alternative treatment so this is because up to 80% of medications used in children have not been tested in children and we also know that less than 25% of the guidelines especially in cardiology have high level of evidence to support the guideline that's only hardly 25% and further drug safety monitoring relies on voluntary reporting so uh, what is the difference between pragmatic and a traditional clinical trial so in the tra traditional clinical trial here we have we discuss more on the efficacy in ideal situations using ideal comparators and hence it is less generalizable because you have very strict inclusion exclusion criteria whereas a pragmatic clinical trial we talk about the effectiveness in a real world situation which is with relative comparators using relevant outcomes and hence it is more generalizable so what is the difference between efficacy and effectiveness efficacy is performance of an inven invention and so intervention under controlled circumstances that is when you are doing a randomized controlled uh, rct trial we normally talk about the intervention under very controlled conditions with strict inclusion exclusion criteria whereas effectiveness is under a real world circumstance that is a subtle difference between the two words so hence we see an 
when you talk about the traditional cities, it's more like a funnel. As one of the previous speakers has talked about, you know, recruitment and uh, Dr. I think Shantanu was talking. So when you have an eligible population and you're doing a trial like diabetes, hypertension, you know, you, you know, even in fact, uh, promise the sponsors that I can give you 100 patients in three months. But when you actually go through the study, go through the inclusion exclusion criteria, which are extremely stringent, we just have few patients who can be put into the trial or who come out successful in the trial. Whereas in the PCT, you have, it is more like a barrel because you have very few exclusions and hence you have defectiveness in a broader subset of population. So this is a little graphical presentation for a better understanding for you. And here again, when you take this pyramid, you see the basis of the pyramid is extremely broad, which means you have more explanatory clinical trials. And these explanatory clinical trials have high internal validity. I'm sorry, you have high, yeah, high internal validity because that is uh, the priority of a randomized controlled explanatory trial is more on internal validity. And we use a normally a smaller sample size more sophisticated trial design in a very controlled atmosphere. Whereas when you go to a pragmatic trial, which are lesser in number, you have high external validity because the priority is there for generalization. So external validity is high. You have a large sample size, simpler design, and it's done in a more diverse setting. So this is a more pictorial presentation of exactly what I was talking about here. You can see, when you're doing a trial in a randomized trial, you first design the trial from you know, evidence which you just get through literature or from the previous studies. And then you implement that in the pilot study under controlled setting using very stringent protocols. And then you evaluate the data you get and then try to adjust subsequently with the adjustments placing on the data and then try to disseminate into the generous um, you know, community or to the clinicians. So when we come to a PCT, where you have the external validity is going to be more important a priority, this data can again be modified. The solution, or you can identify the problem, the clinician identifies some problem or some issue and then gets it back into the cycle to again do further trials. So in a learning healthcare system, research influences practice, and practice influences research. And this is what I think Dr. Sanish was also talking about. So this is just a picot comparison of a pragmatic versus explanatory trials, which I've just uh, tabulated for convenience. Pragmatic trials are in real life patients, whereas explanatory trials are in a homogeneous population. And then you have more flexible uh, you know, interventions with changes in a pragmatic trial where it cannot be done in the explanatory trial. The inclusion criteria said HbA1c is 7.9. It cannot be made a round figure of eight. It has to be 7.9. So it's so stringent. Then you use an active comparator instead of a placebo in pragmatic trials. And then you have clinical important outcomes and then the follow-up can be sometimes even of longer duration. So what is the PRESS tool which I was talking to, uh, to you about? In 2009, there are, they have this group of investigators who developed a construct for PCT, which is a process tool, which defines how pragmatic the trial is in contrast to how explanatory it can be, which means there are some 10 domains, uh, like the spokes of the wheel. But subsequently, in 2013, Lauden, they have uh, concised it a little and made it process two, which is actually having nine spokes. So what happens? What are these uh, you know, individual aspects which are considered are right from the eligibility, recruitment, setting? You, know, you have all these nine domains. And uh, the more central the data lies is more explanatory in approach. It is more towards the hub. Whereas if uh, the trial takes uh, more, if it goes more towards the periphery or the rim, it is more pragmatic in its approach. So this you can, basing on this, you can decide whether the trial can be explanatory or pragmatic, and then you have the various indicators on it. I don't, I just gave this, you know, for you to understand that there is something like this. Details, uh, you can just go through it. It's pretty simple. 
So what are the benefits of pragmatic clinical trial? They're more practical because they're, uh, you know, they take into account everyday practice. They're more inclusive because you include a diverse population. They keep everyone in the healthcare system engaged, right from the patients, the healthcare providers, and they're who are all involved in the design, conduct of the study, results, interpret, and all that. And then it is pretty relevant because this can be extrapolated into a real life situation. But having said that, I would just like to add that there are a few ethical and regulatory challenges because as of now, we were more used to conducting RCTs under strict controlled conditions. So the existing regulatory and ethical framework are capable of protecting the rights and interests of patients in the present uh, situation because we are always under the assumption that medical practice should be distinguished from research, wherein the physician is one who integrates all the knowledge they have towards, you know, directed towards the patient for better patient care. And then we are under the impression that researchers' primary interest is to create a generalizable knowledge. And this he does by explicit, explicit protocols and procedures. So what is the solution, you know, for this uh, two ends of the, you know, the spectrum? Perhaps a clinician scientist like Tanish was mentioning, if you have a data rich integration of research as and practice, then it is perhaps going to be a more better solution to this problem. However, there are questions regarding regulatory and ethical challenges which need to be taken into account. And what are the limitations of uh, the, the PCTs during the designing? Because it is a more heterogeneous population, the site selection may be an issue because we have tertiary care, big centers and primary and you know, government or you know, those entire two cities where the patient population tends to be a little different. So when you have a site selection, then this may be an issue. Patient selection again may be an issue because since uh, it is uh, the enrollment may be low, there may be more loss to follow because you are just doing it in a, a real life situation. And this can again encompass the ge jeopardize the validity and generalizability because once there is a dropout, then your sample size changes and then it, there are uh, you know, statistical issues. And again, informed consent. So this is going to be an ethical issue because uh, if you're going to do it uh, in a real life situation in an OP or something like that, then again, informed consent may be a little difficult because when we are doing an RCT, we do it in a very systematic way. Then comparator selection, because if you have a diverse set of hospitals, like suppose you are going to do a trial in diabetic neuropathy, then some uh, doctors may prefer taking gabapentin as a comparator, where some may prefer pregabalin and some may prefer both. So again, how uh, the selector is going to be chosen is going to be another issue. Selection of the outcome measures, again, yes, that's an issue. And then regulators demand efficacy and safety data, which again has to be done through a real world situation, which may be a little difficult. Then the operational issues are eCRF-based data collection. If you're do, using smaller hospitals which don't have a proper CDAC system or a proper um, you know, computerized system, then again, from getting data from uh, may be a little difficult. And the data routinely, if you collect it from an EHR as an insurance claim may be accurate, but may not be sufficient for analysis. And generalization of the valid, accurate, and complete data may be challenging due to missing data and, and uh, data entry errors also. So again, these are some of the challenges in the operational phase. Again, as we discuss the safety and the requirement of the timelines will be again a little challenging in real life compared to the um, routine stuff. However, both the trials use randomization procedures to decrease the bias. So time is now for pragmatic clinical trials in guiding response to global pandemic. So what happened in the pandemic is, we had one very important trial, a pragmatic randomized controlled trial on the efficacy of chloroquine in coronavirus. So here what happened was 53 hospitalized patients were taken, chloroquine was given, 400 milligram twice daily for seven days uh, uh, in addition to the standard care. But 
But what happened here was the results suggest there was no important antiviral effect of HCQ in human infected with SARS-CoV-2. So this was a, a landmark study, which was a very important study. And then there was there's still an, there's another ongoing study, coagulopathy of hospitalized COVID-19, where uh, again, it's a pragmatic randomized uh, controlled trial comparing standard uh, therapeutic anticoagulant versus, versus standard. The recruitment is still ongoing. Here again, same thing, the patients are, uh, about 462 patients were taken who were randomized and then you had the standard care versus unfractionated parent. The trial is still ongoing, so we don't have the data. The future trends, sorry, sorry, I'm, future trends in clinical trials is there is an overlap between this randomized trials and pragmatic trials. So I, it's not ideal to view them as two separate buckets because they are in actually interlaced. And here we have the continuum where you have the explanatory clinical trial. Can an intervention, intervention work in an ideal condition versus a pragmatic trial? Can an intervention work under usual conditions? So as I told you, it is, you know, there is a mix and match here. Future trends in clinical trials have the, so next what may come up is, the questions may be developed by the clinicians and patients, that is in pragmatic clinical trial versus the questions developed by researchers and sponsors. So in future, maybe the protocol preparation procedures may change. Then clinical trials generally focus on gathering data for regulatory approval. So you have, uh, in future, maybe you have clinical trials which gather data to answer the frequent questions asked by clinicians and investigators. Thus may also be designed to support future regulatory approvals. And uh, this is a small, uh, you know, schematic representation of the pragmatic um, clinical trials versus an RCT for new oncology drugs. So here what happens is if there is a good data or if there is supportive data from phase one and phase two of an oncology clinical trial, then you can apply for an accelerated approval. Conduct a randomized controlled trial with strict adherence to protocol under homogeneous population and then go for full approval. Whereas the same thing, if, you're, if it is being done in the pragmatic way, what can be done is if there is an exceptionally good data, then there can be a proposal given to the regulators for accelerated approval, conducting the same trial in pragmatic real world situation Whereas, uh, wherein you're going to take more flexible adherence to the study protocol and patients can be assessed during routine care, heterogeneous population can be taken under the real world settings and that data can be submitted for approval. And this has been very encouraging in um, oncology trials and this has been done in oncology. oncology. So, uh, but I don't uh, think that we should go home with, you know, take, take home message should not be like, uh, you don't need uh, randomized clinical trials. Of course, that is not what I want to actually, you know, conclude. Trials with high internal validity, which is the RCTs are required for new interventions and identification of cause effect relationships. So we still need randomized controlled clinical trials. And the results of pragmatic trials include many post hoc explanatory analysis. So yes, because you're doing it in real world, you may have a lot of uh, post hoc explanatory analysis, which again, in turn, require to be verified with explanatory clinical trial. And that is the diagram which I had shown earlier, where you had the internal, um, validi uh, internal validity and the external validity, and then the interlace between the researcher and the clinician. So many trials lie in the RCT-PCT con continuum and pragmatic clinical trials do not replace the existing explanatory trials, but they rather complement the existing um, pragmatic explanatory clinical trials. So I think uh, perhaps that was my last slide and I hope I could finish on time. And thank you once again for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Usarani. Uh, that was really a great presentation. 
uh, and everybody knows you are a great clinical pharmacologist and uh, your presentation was really nice and lucid uh, but before i come to the your presentation topic and summarizing everything um, uh, but let me share some of my thoughts like it's a really good feeling that we are we pharmacologists are celebrating world clinical pharmacology day uh, clinical trial day uh, in such a way interacting with uh, many pharmacologists and uh, investigators, uh, EC members, trial participants, etc. Uh, so it's really a nice initiative uh, Initiative being done by the uh, West Bengal Pharmacology Branch and Innova Care. Particularly, I would uh, like to thank Sambo for this great initiative. And now coming to the, your topic, as you rightly highlighted, designing different trial is a very, very important thing to reach at the uh, proper conclusion in any experimental uh, thing. Uh, particularly in health research. So as you rightly highlighted that explanatory trials uh, focus more on the designing, monitoring, uh, and homogeneity, uh, but uh, it always tries to minimize the error and bias in the study. So in that way, it becomes very limited. And when you apply to the real life scenario, it becomes very, uh, maybe some limitation in the real life scenario. But on the contrary, pragmatic clinical trials um, are really nowadays proving to be very you're stuck yeah. and good number of patients and then we have heterogeneity of the population so naturally uh, in future we are going to have more and more of this kind of uh, pragmatic clinical trial as you have already highlighted uh, for the coronavirus disease mm, and you also nicely uh, highlighted however the limitations and the challenges. So uh, in uh, definitely RCT and all is going to be there, but this will only add and complementary uh, to this. So with this note, I again thank you. Um, thank you and also to the organizers for this great uh, event and the great opportunity for me. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Dr. Usarani. Thank you, Tripti. And thank you, Sambo. Thank you, all the participants and the organizers. Thank you all. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Shambhu, and I, I thank Dr. Kota and uh, Dr. Tupti, and uh, it, was, it was a pleasure interacting with the user again on this platform. Nice, nice. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, sirs. So we, we, we have to move to the last session, but this is a very important session, and to share the session, we are really fortunate to have a noted clinical pharmacologist, Professor Shandu Munshi who is uh, the head and of the Department of Clinical and Experimental Pharmacology at School of Tropical Medicine. Welcome you, sir, to chair the session. And also, we, we are really fortunate to have Dr. Chiranjit Bhakchi, who is an associate professor at Department of Clinical and Experimental Pharmacology at School of Tropical Medicine, who is also a very keen uh, statistics lover. So welcome you, sir, to this e podium. Over two chair persons, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shambo. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome uh, our speaker for this session, uh, Dr. Obijit Hajra, who is a famous clinical pharmacologist and uh, head of the department of. Uh, uh, this uh, IPGMR uh, pharmacology and uh, Dr. Abhijit will speak on uh, a very important topic that is uh, superiority, non-inferiority and equivalence trials and how they compare with each another. There is a lot of uh, uh, questions uh, regarding this and uh, not only uh, the sponsors are uh, confused uh, we doctors and clinical pharmacologists, uh, we are also in dilemma which to apply when. So uh, I'm sure uh, Dr. Avijit will uh, address all these issues in details. Over to Chiranjit. Uh, thank you, Samba, for for nice introduction, actually, uh, as uh, Dr. Munsi, Professor Munsi has started and, and introduced 
my teacher my guide in during my md studies professor hajra so i don't need to uh, uh, continue this for the same but only i want to mention one thing that uh, all the statistics which i have learned till date that is uh, all of this from uh, say myself professor ubhijit hajra and still i am continuing to learn it from him so it will be a pleasure to chair this session i am honored really to chair this session i don't know whether i am worthy to chair this session so i will i am i, I will uh, keenly uh, watch and listen to his this presentation during this 20 or 25 minutes so i request that to present his deliberation thank you sir good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and distinguished participants for this meeting on the occasion of the international clinical trials day my brief is to carry you through this session in which we'll be speaking about alternative clinical trial designs so the title says that it's a comparison of superiority non inferiority and equivalence trials so we are familiar with some of these concepts but they are more aligned to statistical interpretation of the clinical trial data and therefore may be new to some of us it's actually a complex topic but in the span of the next 20 or 25 minutes i'll try to present it in a simple manner now conventionally when we do clinical trials we usually try to show that a particular intervention is working better than a standard or control intervention so simply put the objective in a conventional clinical trial is to show that one intervention a is better than b or it may be the other way now b better than a statistically we approach this situation by a conventional null hypothesis so the null hypothesis expresses the position the conservative position of no difference or no change as a result of the treatment but when a clinician is working clinician usually hopes to discover a difference so usually they try to see if a new treatment or a new intervention is better than an existing standard treatment now in all such cases an effect size is selected on the basis of which the sample size calculation is done now this effect size very simply stated refers to the smallest difference between the treatments that could be construed as clinically important clinically meaningful difference so it is not a statistical concept rather the effect size is a matter of clinical judgment suppose we are comparing two antihypertensive drugs and we say that the standard drug is able to lower systolic blood pressure by let's say 15 mm mercury what would we expect with our test drug would we be satisfied if it can lower the systolic blood pressure on average by 17 mm mercury that is a difference of just 2 mm compared to the standard treatment some would argue that this is not really a meaningful difference a difference of 2 mm hardly makes any clinical impact however we may decide that once you encounter a difference of 5 mm mercury in the systolic blood pressure lowering then we can consider this to be a clinically meaningful difference and for the purpose of the study that we are going to do we can take 5 mm mercury as the smallest difference which would be clinically meaningful so this is what we mean by effect size now in a conventional clinical trial there are two directions in which the null hypothesis may be rejected so null hypothesis as we have said is a conservative position of there being no difference between the treatment so if difference lies in the direction that a would be better than b to a sufficient extent more than what we have chosen as the effect size then this is one direction of the difference if the difference lies in the reverse direction that is treatment b better as treatment a by more than what we have taken as the effect size then this also can be an acceptable difference so that's why we are saying that there are 
two chances or two directions in which the null hypothesis may be rejected. The testing is done in a two-tailed manner with the total acceptable type 1 error that we conventionally choose in clinical trials, that is the 5% error being equally distributed between the two tails of the distribution curve. Naturally, therefore, each tail is allocated 2.5% of the type 1 error. We can present the results along with the 95% confidence intervals. Rather, it is now the norm to present the primary outcome at least with the it is 95% confidence interval. So this allows whatever difference that we are observed to be stated along with a margin of error. And the 95% confidence interval would obviously exclude zero difference between the two treatments. Now, when we summarize the results of a conventional clinical trial, which nowadays we are calling a superiority trial, we can summarize the results like this. So look at this diagram where on the right side, it goes in the direction of the new drug being better than the control drug. On the left side, it goes in the direction of the control drug being better than the new drug. Now, if you look at the middle result, there you see the point estimate. Point estimate clearly is in favor of the new drug. And this difference between the bold line and the stipple line being the FX size that we have chosen. So the smallest difference that we are considering clinically meaningful or important. And if you look at this panel, if you look at this panel, you see that the point estimate is clearly in favor of the new drug, as well as both limits of the 95% confidence interval. The upper limit, as well as the lower limit is clearly ahead of the effect size that we have selected. So this is a case where you can convincingly state that the new drug is better than the older drug. Now look at the upper panel here. Although the point estimate is in favor of the new drug, the upper limit of the 95% CI obviously would be in the same direction. Look at the lower limit of the 95% CI. This actually does not cross the effect size and it is falls within the effect size that we have selected. So if you look at the results, so there is a possibility that on one direction, in one direction, the difference that we'll find would actually be less than the effect size that we have selected. So in this case, although we are seeing a trend towards superiority, we have to say that superiority has not been established convincingly. In all the other three cases, you see, in the first two, the point estimate is actually falling beyond the FX size in the direction of the control treatment. And in this case, in this case, in the last case, although the point estimate is falling beyond the FX size in favor of the new drug, the confidence interval is too high and on the one side is actually falling in favor of the control treatment. So only in one case, if we go by our 95% confidence interval approach, we can say that superiority has been convincingly established. In the other cases, the superiority is still equivocal. It has not been convincingly established. Now, so far, conventionally that we have done clinical trials and we are still doing clinical trials in that manner. If we are unable to discover superiority of one treatment over another, it's a natural tendency on our part to say that, okay, since treatment A has not been found to be superior to treatment B, we can say that it is comparable. So in a conventional trial, what we are nowadays calling superiority trial, the null hypothesis is the equivalence hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis excludes equivalence. However, the changing view or the current view is that a superiority trial that fails to demonstrate superiority cannot be automatically construed to have demonstrated either non-inferiority with respect to the standard treatment or equivalence with respect to the standard treatment. So if we are trying to establish equivalence with our standard treatment or we are trying to show that our new treatment is not inferior, is no worse than a standard treatment, we have to specifically 
look for these endpoints rather than depending upon the rejection of superiority to do, draw these conclusions. So from the outset, a trial must be designed conclusively to demonstrate either of the above outcomes. Accordingly, we now have non-inferiority or no worse than trials and equivalent or as good as trials. So now we will look up, take up the case of non-inferiority trials. Simply speaking, a non-inferiority trial is one that aims to demonstrate that the effect of a new treatment is not worse than that of an active comparator treatment by more than a pre-specified margin. It won't be exactly identical. It may be a little worse than the comparator treatment, and we have to select an active comparator, but it could be no worse than a certain, certain margin. So somewhat like the effect size that we concept that we use in case of superiority trials. However, the pre prescribed margin that should not be exceeded in order to demonstrate non-inferiority, in this case would be called non-inferiority margin. It is depicted using the same symbol delta as the effect size, but in this case we do not use the term effect size, rather we use the term non-inferiority margin. A non-hypothesis in a non-inferiority trial is different from that in a conventional superiority trial. And this is something which is very important to remember because the whole concept of non-inferiority is based on this central idea. In case of a non-inferiority trial, the null hypothesis actually implies that the new treatment is inferior to the active comparator. And we are seeking to reject this null hypothesis in order to establish non-inferiority. Now, why do we do a non-inferiority trial? As you may have guessed, we will usually do a non-inferiority trial in situations where we cannot expect to demonstrate superiority. We cannot expect that a new treatment would be convincingly better than an active comparator. Usually, non-inferiority trials would be done in one of the following situation. The existing standard treatment already has a high success rate. So therefore, uh, it is superfluous to think of an even better success rate. The new treatment is actually a me too drug. So it's pharmacologically, biologically very similar to an existing treatment. And you can only expect that the results would be as good. Irrespective of efficacy, the new treatment can have secondary advantages. For instance, it may be safer it may be less costly or more cost effective, or it may be less invasive or more acceptable to patients. And therefore we can still have a case for introducing this treatment into practice, even though it may be slightly worse with respect to the effectiveness outcome. But clearly it shouldn't be so worse that we have to disregard the treatment in the first place. So it can be a little worse and we, want to establish this non-inferiority by doing a trial. New treatment is simply an alternative dosage form or a new delivery device. So it is essentially the same drug or uh, a very similar uh, member of a class of drugs, uh, which, and you cannot hope to demonstrate superiority over the existing treatment, the existing comparator. However, it may be available in a new formulation or it may be available through a new delivery device which would uh, have the possibility of enhanced patient adherence to treatment, and therefore you'd like to see the market. And therefore, if you have to introduce into the market, you do a trial, but with the objective of showing that it is no worse than the standard treatment. So here are some examples from literature. Examples are a little dated. Uh, that's because the reason that I've not updated the slides for some time now, but essentially, if you read through some of these titles, it will give you a good idea of why and where non inferiority trials are done. Okay, so Topiramid, second one, let's see the, see the second title Topiramid versus Amitriptyline in Migraine Prevention, a 26 weeks multi center randomized double blind double lummy parallel group non inferiority trial in adult migraineurs. So, Amitriptyline being an established treatment, you're trying to Propose topiramate, bring topiramate as an alternative, but 
from your preliminary experience with propylamate, you know that uh, it won't be vastly superior to amitriptyline. So all you want to demonstrate is that it is no inferior to amitriptyline, taking amitriptyline as a standard comparator. Okay. Look at the last point. Efficacy and safety of inhaled insulin compared to insulin lispro in patients with type 1 diabetes mellitus in a six-month randomized non inferiority trial. So insulin is the main stay of treatment in type 1 diabetes mellitus, and we are already using the insulin analog, insulin lispro in these patients. And now you want to introduce inhaled insulin for the treatment of type 1 diabetes mellitus patient. It is basically a same drug, but same drug, but being delivered in a novel manner. And therefore, uh, initially, you just want to show that it is non inferior to the standard insulin that it is available. Going on to uh, some other examples. Comparison of mometasone steroid dry powder inhaler and fruticasone propionate dry powder inhaler in patients with moderate to severe persistent asthma requiring high dose inhaled corticosteroid therapy findings from a non inferiority trial. So you're using, you're trying to position uh, inhaled corticosteroid monometasone puride as an alternative to an already existing established inhaled corticosteroid fruticasone propionic. And so your goal is modestly to show that the new corticosteroid is no worse than the existing drug, which gives uh, acceptably good results. Look at the third one, triptan of streptococcal pharyngitis with once daily compared with twice daily amoxicillin. So here you are basically using the same drug, but you want to introduce an alternative dosing regime for whatever reason, convenience or otherwise. But before you do that, you have to show that the new dosing regime would not be inferior to the established dosing regime. So uh, these trials give you a fairly good idea of situations where non-inferiority analysis could be done. Now look at now let us look at a concrete example and to see how these non-inferiority trials are given. So the study design is a randomized double-blind multicentric parallel group study with the objective to demonstrate that the new treatment for 14 days is at least as effective as standard treatment for 14 days in the treatment of adult community acquired pneumonia. The endpoint that we are looking at is cure at the end of two weeks of treatment. So what are the uh, two treatments? The standard treatment is oral amoxicillin gravidanate, 500 milligram plus 125 milligram thrice steady. So this is our conventional coamoxiclab regimen. And the new treatment which is being proposed is oral coamoxiclab, coamoxiclab in a control release formulation containing 875 milligram amoxicillin and 125 milligram clavulanate administered twice daily. So essentially, this is the same drug, but we are trying to find out an alternative dosing regimen. So the non inferiority margin, which is selected, is 10% in cure rate. The success with the new treatment should not differ, assuming it would be less than the standard treatment by more than 10%. So if it is more than 10%, if the result we get more than 10%, then the new regimen would have to be treated as clearly inferior. But if the results remain within this 10% margin, then the new treatment can be said to be no worse than your existing treatment. So what is the null hypothesis in this case? You can say written out there, H0 equal to pi n minus pi s, less than or equal to minus 10%. And remember that H0 implies that the new treatment is inferior to the standard treatment. But the non inferiority hypothesis states that although inferior, it could not be inferior by more than 10%, because 10% is the non inferiority margin that we have chosen. And the alternative hypothesis is that there would be a difference between the treatment, but the difference could be within this 10% boundary. So H1 implies new treatment is clinically non-inferior to the standard treatment within the predefined allowable range, delta equal to 10% of clinical 
significant. So the sample size calculation which was done for the study showed that we have to take 592 patients of community acquired pneumonia with 222 patients per arm. Okay, a dropout rate is assumed to be 25%. Now, you may have already noticed that this is quite a high sample size. And in fact, for non-inferiority trials, they're usually larger than corresponding superiority trials. This is because that if you place the effect size in the superiority trial and the non-inferiority margin in a non-inferiority trial side by side, you'll usually find that as clinical judgment dictates, this non-inferiority margin would be smaller in magnitude than the effect size. And in a study, if you are looking for a smaller difference, obviously the sample size would be larger. Now, analysis method. Analysis is on the basis of calculating 95% confidence interval around the primary outcome measure, which in this case is a two-week cure. So two-sided 95% confidence interval for the difference in cure between the two arms. This CI is calculated in the usual manner by using a normal approximation to the binomial distribution. We are using cure as an endpoint, which is a binary variable. Okay. Now, in this study, the results which were obtained by per protocol analysis, that means excluding all subjects who are protocol violators, that the difference is 2.7%. That means the new dosing regime is worse than the standard dosing regime by 2.7%. But look at the 95% confidence interval, 8.3% on one side, which is within the 10% boundary, you have chosen, but minus 3%, minus 3%. That means in this case, the new treatment, if we go by this limit, the new treatment is doing better than the control treatment. So ideally we would have like, have like both the boundaries of the 95% CI to fall within this 10% range. If we do an intention to treat analysis, the result that we are getting is slightly different, 7% and look at the 95% confidence limit. The lower limit is okay, 0.9%, but the upper limit, that seems to be exceeding the FX size. Therefore, in this particular study, uh, non-inferiority is being demonstrated, although there is uh, some lapse in, in total acceptability. So broadly, the authors drew a conclusion that oral coamoxiclab 875-125 milligram control release twice daily is not inferior to oral coamoxiclab 500 and 125 milligram twice daily in the treatment of community acquired pneumonia in adults when given for 14 days. Now, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the choice of non inferiority margin. As in conventional trials, we spend some time in deciding what should be the acceptable effect size we need to spend some time in deciding what should be the acceptable non-inferiority margin. This would be based on clinical judgment, but nowadays regulatory authorities, at least in the more common therapeutic areas, are coming out what, with what is uh, uh, what can be seen as a model non-inferiority margin in different therapeutic segments. Other factors that we, need, we may need to consider in deciding upon the non-inferiority margin is the risk to the patient associated with treatment failure, toxicity related to active comparator, cost, ease of use related to active comparator. But overall, the value of delta in this case is likely to be smaller than in a placebo controlled superiority size. The effect size in a conventional superiority trial has, been, has to be undisputedly large enough to establish clinical superiority. So one thumb rule is that in a corresponding superiority trial, if we take a particular value of the effect size, then the non-inferiority margin can be half of that effect size. But this is not a uh, universal thing or a constant thing, uh, and we need to vary the non-inferiority margin. So there is an interesting phenomenon called biopic. Suppose we are doing a non-inferiority trial, and we choose a standard comparator. Okay. So suppose the first non-inferiority study that we do, TA1, 
we choose a non-infinity margin with respect to the standard comparator TS. So we want to establish that TA1 is slightly worse but not inferior to TA. Suppose that is established. Now we want to do a second try, a second drug in a non-infinity analysis. Now what should be the comparator for the second drug? Should we choose TS or can we choose TA1 whose non-infinity has already been demonstrated? Now we can choose either, but if we think back a little, we'll realize that every time we replace the standard comparator by another comparator where non-infinity has been demonstrated, another comparator is actually a little worse than the standard treatment, although the extent of worseness falls within the non-infinity mark. So if we do this a number of times, ultimately, it may so happen that the non-infinity margin that we are looking at is actually quite a difference with the standard treatment. So if at every step, instead of the standard treatment, we choose an active comparator's non-infinity has already been demonstrated in earlier studies, then the magnitude of error tends to get magnified. So this is called the bio-creep phenomenon. So the so dictum or the thumb rule is always choose the best active comparator that is available as the control treatment. Okay, so choose the current gold standard as the active comparator. So sample size for a non-infinity trial is broadly based on the same principles as that in a conventional trial. But since a non-infinity margin delta would only be a fraction of the effect size in a corresponding placebo controlled superiority trial, the sample size would be larger. However, the sample size may be smaller than that for an actively controlled superiority trial, which tries to pick up a small difference. So in general, if we consider the corresponding superiority uh, design study, the non-infinity margin, because it is smaller than the effect size chosen in the superiority trial, would return a larger sample size, larger sample size. And the other, other factors that we consider, like type 1 error probability, type 2 error probability, uh, etc., remains the same. Okay. So this is an illustration of the numbers required for non-infinity trial, given some common assumptions. So we'll skip it at this moment. But we have the take-home idea that usually the sample size is larger. Analyzing a non-infinity trial, in non-infinity trials, a confidence interval has to be calculated to estimate the range of values within which the true treatment difference is likely to lie. Intention to treat approach is regarded as the most valid approach in analyzing a superiority trial. But problem with including data after study drug discontinuation in a non-infinity trial is that it tends to bias the results towards equivalence. And some authors prefer that in a non-infinity study, we actually <laughs> post uh, uh, both results, results from per protocol analysis and results from intention to treat analysis and hope that there is no major discordance between the two approaches. Okay, so moving on from non-infinity trial, equivalence trial, its goal is to demonstrate the absence of a meaningful difference between two treatments so that one can be substituted for the other in practice. Statistically also, the objective is to show that there is no significant difference between the two treatment arms. So here we need to define an equivalence margin. Now remember that the non-infinity margin is on one side, goes to one side, but an equivalence margin is two-sided because equivalence can mean that the comparative treatment does slightly better or it does slightly worse compared to the standard treatment. So equivalence margin is two-sided and denotes the largest difference in outcomes that can be treated as clinically insignificant. So an objective, what we regard as the null hypothesis in a conventional superior trial, that becomes the objective of testing in our equivalence trial. And here the null hypothesis is that the two treatments are different with respect to the mean response but the difference is within the equivalence margin, delta that we have selected. So 
minus delta to plus delta, the difference would lie within this boundary. And the two-sided 95% confidence interval of the difference in main responses should also entirely lie in this minus delta to plus delta range. Okay. So to illustrate the concept, let us look at this diagram again. And we see that only in case of the middle panel, equivalence is conclusively established. So here the point estimate is not showing any difference between your control and standard treatment. And if you look at the upper and lower limits of the 95% confidence interval, they are fully within the plus minus delta to plus delta range. Okay. Uh, in, the, in this case, in the upper one, uh, there is clearly a trend towards equivalence, but since the upper and lower limits of the confidence interval slightly exceeding delta, we cannot say that the equivalence has been uh, shown conclusively. In all other cases, the equivalence is not shown in at all because the point estimate is clearly uh, deviating away from the line of no difference. Okay, so equivalence margin is the largest difference that is clinically meaningful and acceptable. If delta is the anticipated difference between active control and placebo control, then delta by two can be taken as the equivalence margin. However, this would be similar to a non-inflative margin and most authors prefer to take an even smaller equivalence margin, particularly when they are dealing with some critical endpoints such as motility. So for instance, this margin can be one third of the effect size in a uh, superiority trial. Note that delta and equivalence trials being small, sample size correspondingly be even larger. And in the special case of no anticipated treatment difference is all, the sample size is calculated with a special adjustment to the formula and it returns actually a very large sample size. While analyzing an equivalence trial, we remember that because the equivalence margin is a two-sided entity, each component is tested separately. And this is tantamount to stating that the overall null hypothesis is a combination of two separate null hypotheses. And this is uh, testing has to be done separately for each component. If the variable in question is a numerical variable, then we use the two one-sided t-test approach for testing. Okay. We encounter a special case of equivalence testing in our bioequivalence studies, where we try to establish equivalence of pharmacokinetic parameters. And here the convention is to use the 90% confidence interval rather than the 95% confidence interval. But uh, um, there are other ways of approaching uh, this pharmacokinetic equivalence too. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that the concept of superiority trials, non-inferiority trials, equivalence trials have evolved out of the necessity of demonstrating that sometimes treatments have to be shown as no worse than an existing standard treatment or comparable to an existing standard treatment. And where our goal is clearly not to show the superiority of a, a new treatment against an established older treatment or standard treatment. Okay. Now, there are some philosophical issues over non infected trials. If you keep aside all the mathematics, all the confidence intervals, and let's say we are comparing two drugs A and B. What are the possibilities? There are basically three possibilities. Either drug A is better than B, or the drug A is worse than B, or the drug A and B are equivalent. These are the only three options available in real life. Either drug, drug is going to be better than or worse than. So in real life, we don't say it is not better than. It could be worse than, but we are undecided. So this is some of the things that mathematically happens in case of this alternative trial designs. And therefore, uh, it is not mandatory that in our studies, we always use this type of designs. But anyway, they illustrate some of the evolving concepts in clinical trial methodology, particularly when our goal is clearly not to show the superiority of one treatment over the other. So. Uh, We'll stop here today and
Uh, I'm sorry that I cannot be with you as a uh, as a live program because of my earlier commitments. But if there are any questions which require my application of my mind, I'll be happy to do that. And the questions would be forwarded to me by IPS Best Bengal branch. Thank you. And over to the coordinator. Thank you, Professor Hajra, for this uh, very, very nice uh, presentation on a very difficult topic. And uh, really, uh, it was important topic for today's program. I uh, request Dr. Bakshi to uh, give the con concluding comments. So. Thank you, sir, for these nice uh, deliberations. Actually, I, we have learned a lot. And actually, uh, one question, sir, if you can uh, enlighten us about this, is can a single trial, with a single trial, can we design both superiority and non-inferiority? Or as you have mentioned, that in case of the non-inferiority, if the sample size, we can uh, uh, make an adequate sample size, a superiority can be established with the, with the non-inferiority design as, as well. So your explanation, sir, in this regard, for the want of time and cost. Actually, sir, there is there is there is some emergency that happened. Oh. So Hajra, sir, actually done one. This is one recorded video. So we had done one recording yesterday uh, night. Okay. So that is why, sir, uh, sir is not now present. So sir also in the last part told that if any arise question arises. Uh, that can be answered by you also, sir, directly, or uh, or sir can be contacted through email, and sir will send the personal answers to them. Okay, thank you. So then, uh, the we can conclude the session today, and we can ask the delegates to uh, share their questions if they, if anything comes in their mind, and so we can take care of this questions in future or can request to Professor Hajra. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shambhu, for organizing the same. And it's a nice uh, experience for both of all of us to attend this session. And, and thanks again for inviting me to share this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Shantanu Munshi, sir, Dr. Chiranjit Bhakti, sir, for giving us your, your valuable time and we we have a very important discussion today regarding clinical trials different aspects of clinical trials and we are really fortunate that professor shurita pal madam the uh, vice chancellor of west bengal university of health science professor devashish Bhattacharya, director of medical education west bengal professor shushanto bandopadhyay Ex-Director of Medical Education, West Bengal Chapter, Professor Jyotir Moy Pal, Professor of Medicine, Archikon Medical College, and Dean Elect of Indian College of Physicians, Professor Shoilendra Handu, Professor and Head of Department of Pharmacology at Ames Rishikesh, Professor Lopamudra Rai Choudhury, Professor Lopamudra Choudhury is also the Vice President of uh, Indian Pharmacological Society West Bengal Chapter and also she is Professor of Pharmacology at Archikor Medical College. We also are really fortunate to have Professor Urmila Thatte, Madam, and Professor Krishnan Shure, Dr. Bhavan Singh, Dr. Sanis Davis, Professor, uh, Professor uh, Partho Sharuti Kormokar, Professor Kali Portonayak, Professor Trupti Swain, Professor Devashish Hota, and Professor Usharani Pingali. But I, I really want to thank Professor Shantanu Kumar Tripathi, sir, who is my mentor, my guide, to actually build up this program, this academic event, the academic contents, and giving us a wonderful talk also. We are really thankful to Professor Obhijit Hajra, sir, because of some issues, emergency issues. Uh, he's not 
able to present today live, but he had given his time yesterday night at very late hours, and we uh, have a recording of this wonderful deliberation. So thank, we are really thankful to Professor Obhiji Thajra, sir. Now I request Professor Shantanu Kumar Tripathi, sir, who is uh, our mentor, our guide, and he's a very, uh, uh, you, you always want to hear from him. So, sir, any concluding remarks from your side? So thank you, Dr. Shamasdar, for uh, hosting this wonderful uh, event and uh, celebrating the International Clinical Trials Day this year. Uh, we all know that it was 1747, that uh, historical SCARB trial, which was planned by and conducted by James Lean. So that is uh, otherwise first reported randomized control trial. And uh, we commemorate this day and we take the opportunity to spread the message of the cause of clinical trial among the different stakeholders. And when we talk of one part is of course the scientific aspects of conduct of clinical trials that we have devoted a lot of effort and time today. On the other hand, uh, as we all know that clinical trial cannot occur, cannot happen without patients. And the patient's attitude and perception towards clinical trial, it is time that we also invest our, our effort and time in, uh, in uh, positively modify the attitude of the potential trial participants and patients. Okay, it, we must appreciate that uh, for any new intervention to come, uh, all of us have the obligation to contribute, all citizens, okay, all over the world. So if we are interested to get our life, to live a longer life and to also live a better quality life, then we have no alternative than to think of discovering and developing newer interventions, medical interventions, and uh, not necessarily all the questions in reference to health problems have been answered. So there are newer questions also coming up and there is a need to continuously explore okay, the solutions to our health problems. And for that, clinical trial is absolutely indispensable. Clinical development of interventions, whether it is drug or device or diagnostics. So there is a need to continuously strive for newer medicines, continuously strive for adding value to existing medicines. And for that, we need to also appreciate the role of clinical trial. And all the stakeholders around clinical trials, we need to contribute to the best possible manner. And uh, this day actually gives us the opportunity to, to develop or to have dialogues on the uh, difficult areas or challenge areas around the conduct of clinical trials. I think uh, IPS West Bengal branch has done a wonderful job by uh, using this platform and uh, calling experts in clinical trials from around the country. And we have great opportunity to hear some of the best of presentations uh, we are privileged to listen to. And I must thank the organizers, particularly Dr. Shambhu Samrat Samasda, a highly enthusiastic person, equally busy in his practice in academics and also his organizational capability is uh, par excellence. So I profusely thank you, Dr. Shambo and your team. And uh, you have done, and you, are, you continue to do wonderful things. So thank you very much. And I take this opportunity to thank all others who are still present at this late hour. It's, it was a quite a long day. We started, I think at two o'clock. It's almost now 
past five thirty, more than three and a half hours. But it was very engaging, and we all uh, have thoroughly enjoyed. And hopefully, it is not just an academic event. We would, uh, whatever we have, whatever message we got, we'll try to apply that and translate that in in uh, uh, holding the cause of clinical trial high. With these few words, uh, thanking you all again. I prefer to close at this juncture. Thank you again. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. First of all, we also want to congratulate you to conduct one very important clinical trials to help uh, India to have a good COVID vaccine. So also uh, there is nothing, but we need to confess that even when you are traveling by train and reaching Kolkata at 5 a.m., that time also we need to bother you and we have engaged you to prepare this type of program schedules and everything. And always gave, we are really fortunate to have your blessings in every steps. So thank you, sir. Continue blessings and guiding us. And uh, with that, I also request uh, one of the very key player behind this type of academic program for us. That is Mr. Rohun uh, from Inovo Care Health of Solution and Inovo Care E Academy. He is the director of Inovo Care E Academy. Yeah, he is also having some good projects on medication adherence like MedRef R, and also a very important project he very recently obtained that is a BIDAC project on a device to study autonomic neuropathy, to, uh, to produce one device on uh, autonomic neuropathy. So now may I request Mr. Rohan to say a couple of words regarding today's program and we will wrap up then. We, we miss today Professor Tapun Kumar Mondol, sir, who is the president of Indian Pharmacological Society West Bengal chapter. He had sent his good wishes to this uh, to all of us. And another announcement is like that. Almost 100 participants were there, not in Zoom only, also in other links. So there is a very good uh, numbers of delegates who had attended today. And we are really thankful to all the delegates who had joined today. So, Mr. Rohun, would you want to uh, say something? Uh, hello. Yeah, we thank can you hear you. So, thank you so much, Dr. Shamanjadar, for uh, allowing me this opportunity. I'm so sorry uh, to add on to the existing program time even after this long duration, but I would really love to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Shamanjadar and all the excellent speakers who came together this evening, this afternoon, to make this event a success. Thank you so much. On our own humble part, we, Inovocare Health of Solutions, are trying to develop not one, but two unique products. One is Medper, and another is called Nidla CS, uh, uh, unique to develop and uh, to detect autonomic neuropathy. I hope uh, I will be able to demonstrate and uh, bring them in front of the learned and august audience like yourself very soon. So I'm hoping to, you know, uh, taking out to the patients and actually making a difference. So till then, I hope to have uh, all of you together with us with Inovocare E Academy and Dr. Shamajdar and this continuing uh, to have this kind of uh, CME event. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. So thank you and good night. Thank you.